In our lives, we tend to find interest in certain things we come across. On rare occasions, a singular item may keep someone fascinated more than anything else. They don't know what it is, but this feeling of passion keeps them fixated to the point of obsession. Nothing else matters while this muse is in their presence. Going further and further with their infatuation, time passes in the blink of an eye. Leaving room for nothing else, important lessons of life will go completely unnoticed. Opportunities to broaden their horizons will amount to pearls before swine. Eventually, a point may come when this individual takes a moment to reflect on their journey. Admiring the beauty of what they have, will they eventually notice a lack of something? Will they still be content with their path, even if it gets more narrow as they continue? Is complete dedication justifiable, despite what it may take away? Welcome back to Vagabond. Vagabond is a long-running manga by Takahiko Inoue, with its serialization starting back in 1998. A large portion of the narrative focuses on the character Miyamoto Musashi, watching him fight through countless battles. A number of other individuals make appearances as well, including another swordsman who arguably has some of the best chapters in the entire series. The person in question goes by Sasaki Kojiro. During the early parts of the story, Musashi's friend Matahachi is found doing construction work on a new castle. After a chance meeting with the traveling samurai, Matahachi finds himself in possession of some cash, as well as a certificate meant for Kojiro. Using the name for himself, the wandering man is shocked when he suddenly receives an impressive reputation. Elsewhere, Musashi duels a skilled opponent known as Shishido Baiken. Being defeated in battle, Baiken recalls how his pride in fighting had already been snuffed out by a different man. Revealing the person behind this, Kojiro is mentioned once again. Veiled in mystery, the name alone commands respect, but you'd be hard pressed to find someone who actually knows who he is. While his reputation precedes him, no one would suspect that the famous swordsman comes from very humble beginnings. Going back 17 years before Musashi joins the Battle of Sekigahara, an old man is found fishing by the sea. He isn't exactly treated well, as some local kids steal the food that he just caught. As the children's father returns the provisions, he reveals that this person isn't particularly sociable, keeping away from the other people in the small village nearby. Returning to the beach after consuming his meal, the cheerful man properly introduces himself as Kanamaki Jisai. Not wanting to eat or drink anymore, Jisai has grown tired of his unfulfilled life. Pulling out a letter he received from a former disciple of his, Sasaki Sukeyasu tells of a battle that threatens to overtake the castle he calls home. Sending his son Kojiro to be with his old master, the father hopes the boy can at least be saved from the turmoil. With the message having been sent a few days prior, Jisai assumes the enemy caught whoever was supposed to bring the child. Reflecting on his life, the man gave up any chance of normalcy to pursue the sword. However, even this was robbed from him, having his former school disrupted by a certain powerful student. Losing himself in despair, Jisai has nothing left worth being proud of. Interrupting his negative thoughts, the man notices a body wash up onto the rocks. Looking to the waves, he then sees a small boat carrying a baby. Unfortunately, it doesn't take long for the tiny vessel to be swallowed by the violent sea. Quickly diving in, Jisai desperately makes an attempt to save the helpless child. Miraculously, the old man was able to bring Kojiro to safety. Regrettably, his escorts weren't as lucky, washing up on shore later on. Doing his best to tend to Kojiro's needs, Jisai is ultimately clueless when it comes to kids. Getting lost in the child's pure eyes, the man accidentally loosens his grip, dropping Kojiro onto the beach. Apologizing for his carelessness, Jisai knows that he's got a long way to go if he intends to care for the boy. With hands that have only lived by the sword, the old samurai can't remember the last time they were used in a loving manner. Distracted by his thoughts, Jisai snaps to attention as Kojiro gets a little too close to the waves. Securing him, the samurai notices a blade sticking out of the water. Checking it for himself, it appears to be a much longer sword than he's used to. Placing it next to the crying child, the weapon somehow comforts him instantly. With the eventful day behind him, Jisai decides to hold on to his life for the time being. After all, he's got someone he needs to protect now. 
Shifting over to one of the families in the nearby village, the parents are in the middle of some important business. Used to the hectic surroundings, they're unconcerned by the chaos coming from the neighboring room. That said, they certainly never expected to be barged in on by an old man with a child of his own. Willing to help, they put their lovemaking on hold for the time being. The adults aren't sure what to make of this stranger, but at the very least, they don't consider him to be a threat. Being the first time he's ever asked for help, Jisai realizes that even with his disciples, he never did anything selfless for anyone until now. Despite being the only one Kojiro can depend on, the old man doesn't have the confidence to be a decent father. Heading back to his neighbor's house, Jisai leaves the young child in the care of the parents. Falling asleep on the beach, the samurai hears crying off in the distance. Waking up with a start, Jisai is ready to attend to Kojiro. However, it doesn't take long for him to remember that the boy is no longer in his care. Never able to appreciate the beauty of the ocean, Jisai recalls how nice the view was when he had someone else to share it with. Trying to rid himself of these emotions, the man throws the long blade that washed up with Kojiro into the sea. Once again, he belongs to no one. But thinking on it more, there was a sense of warmth that came from those young eyes. Understanding his mistake, Jisai feels a wave of regret wash over him. Diving into the water, the samurai retrieves the sword, quickly running back to the neighbors in pursuit of his son. Reclaiming Kojiro, the man looks down at the child he abandoned. Met with a warm smile, Jisai knows he made the right decision. Seeing that the samurai isn't a bad person, the mother offers her assistance for the boy's well-being. Taken aback by the kindness being shown to him, Jisai silently bows to show his gratitude before leaving. Dedicating himself to the child with a gentle gaze, the man wants to do his best to make this work. While he's willing to raise Kojiro, Jisai still loses heart a number of times, continuing to wonder if he's right for the job. Thankfully, his neighbors are patient with him, keeping Kojiro safe while the samurai struggles with self-doubt. Wanting to properly repay them, the elder man helps to cultivate their land, taking some of the burden off of the parents. Gradually, three years pass, with the young boy now able to walk around on his own. Carrying his childhood sword around like a blanket, this piques the interest of a passing traveler. Calling out to the child multiple times, the man is surprised when he's met with no reaction whatsoever. Elsewhere, Jisai makes his way back home after a long day of farming. Being caught off guard, an unknown attacker strikes at the old man with lightning speed. Stepping out of his hiding spot, the assailant is the swordsman from earlier on the beach. Recognizing the person in front of him, Jisai is reintroduced to his former rowdy disciple, Ito Itosai. Remembering the past that continues to haunt him, Jisai wonders what purpose he has in visiting his old master. Claiming to be on a training expedition, the man was simply passing through, stopping by to satisfy his nostalgia. Being told to leave, Itosai respects his wishes, parting with a small gift. Understanding the situation his master is dealing with, the samurai gives him some encouraging words. Having the opposite effect, Jisai is dumbfounded to learn that his child can't hear. Not particularly shocked by his behavior, Itosai sees that the old man hasn't changed a bit. Rushing to the beach in a panic, Jisai wants to properly see for himself if this new information is true. Yelling at the top of his lungs, the shouting literally falls on deaf ears. Copying the facial expression of his father, Kojiro thinks they're playing a game. Taking the sword away from the young boy, Jisai leaps into the sea, feeling utterly defeated by his ignorance. He may have kept the small child safe, but the words he tried to share with his son ended up being worthless. Unsheathing the katana, the old man angrily slashes at the waves. However, as he does this, Kojiro finds interest in the flashy movements. With each strike, the boy becomes more fascinated by the activity. Making his way across the sand, Kojiro mimics the strokes of his father. While Jisai continues to lose himself in sadness, the son couldn't be having more fun. Swinging the blade next to the child, the former samurai unknowingly has a bonding moment with the young boy. A little too close for comfort, the old man snaps back to reality in time to stop his emotional outburst. Knowing his son wants the toy back, Jisai makes sure to firmly secure the blade inside. Understanding the painful environment the child comes from, the old master is aware that getting involved with the sword will only perpetuate more despair. Losing his parents, his homeland, and his hearing, Jisai wonders what kind of future is in store for Kojiro. Briefly looking away, the father notices that the waves have stolen his son. Diving in after him, the man knows that he's the only hope Kojiro has of surviving. 
bringing the boy home safely, Jisai is more determined than ever to give his child the best life he can. Embracing the role of a teacher, Jisai makes an attempt to educate his son on Japanese characters. Having a hard time comprehending the pronunciation of words, Kochiro simply laughs at the old man's exaggerated facial expressions. This goes on for quite a while, with the father plastering the walls of his home with a number of different lessons. Wanting a proper trade to provide for his son, Jisai inquires about becoming a fisherman. Unfortunately, the job requires a lot of time and knowledge to properly learn, with the old man being out of his depth. Conflicted, the former master returns home, only to find Kojiro untying the seal of the long sword. Worried for his safety, Jisai rushes over to stop the boy, only for Kojiro to reflexively defend himself. Leaving his father stunned, the young child retreats to the coast with his prized possession. Unsheathing the blade, Kojiro's practice is noticed by someone else currently on the beach. Smelling the person in question, a certain monk from earlier in the story makes an appearance. Being shown the sword, Takuan is left to observe the boy trying to lift the giant weapon. Yelling out to get his attention, the monk has the same revelation that Ito Sai had previously. Managing to swing the sword, Kojiro celebrates the small victory, with the man happy for his accomplishment. However, as Takuan picks up the blade for himself, his expression becomes more stern. Having his arm cut, Kojiro is shocked that his toy is so sharp. Wanting to get a message across, the monk hopes the young child understands what he's trying to say. Making up for the pain, the man quickly bandages the small injury he inflicted. Praying over the weapon, Takuan wishes Kojiro a peaceful future. Looking back to the small boy, his tears have already vanished, leading the man to question if the lesson really sunk in. Regardless, he decides to move on, heading inland towards the Yagyu estate. Elsewhere, Jisai comes to terms with his situation, forcing himself to teach the art of the sword once again. Observed by some of the local villagers, their opinion of his form isn't exactly flattering. While no one is willing to learn from the old master, Jisai remains firmly planted on the beach, hopeful that someone will eventually come. Returning after an uneventful day, the samurai comes home to a rather big mess. Hiding Kojiro's sword, the old man knew this would be the outcome. Wanting his son to move away from the violent weapon he always carries, Jisai is optimistic that the boy can make a decent transition. Unfortunately, Kojiro is determined to have his way, refusing to let things go. Continuing his tantrum throughout their meal, the young child is inconsolable. Tired of dealing with his attitude, Jisai puts a stop to it once and for all. Aggravated by his son's persistence, the man wants him to forget about the blade he can't seem to escape. Knowing how it ruined his life, the former master doesn't want the boy to follow in his footsteps. Regretting his act of violence, Jisai is embarrassed that he still can't properly interact with others. Willing to give the katana back eventually, the samurai is waiting for the right time to do so. Walking back up to his father, Kojiro holds one of the papers from the earlier lessons, showing the characters for sword. Amazed that he understands, Jisai couldn't be more thrilled with the child's progress. Disregarding Kojiro's request, the man is happy enough thinking the boy gets where he's coming from. Forced to improvise, Kojiro checks the debris that washes up on the beach. Finding a large stick that matches the weight of his blade, the young warrior is satisfied with the replacement. As the son continues to awkwardly train himself, the father doesn't get any practice, left alone to wait for a single student. Watching the seasons pass, the former master waits another six years for a change. Sadly, the man still doesn't receive any new applicants. Now nine years old, Kojiro has more than gotten used to his surroundings. Not only has he become skilled at fishing, but his technique with a sizable piece of driftwood has improved as well. One day after going swimming, the young man is accosted by a group of kids from the village. Watching the happy expressions around him, Kojiro assumes they're just having fun, wanting to match their energy. However, as soon as he starts to play, the others retreat in fear. Deciding to ignore them, Kojiro is then forced to deal with a more violent round of teasing. Everyone joins in, leaving the boy to endure the cruel wave of torment. Taking the damage, Kojiro draws a parallel to another word that was taught to him, putting the characters together for pain. Satisfied with their bullying, the group of children make their retreat. Unfortunately for them, a certain someone catches back up. Getting the upper hand, Kojiro is ready to enact his revenge. After a hard-fought battle, the others submit to the lone victor. 
Interrupting the aftermath, another boy going by Tanky makes an appearance. Curious about the reason the other kids are kneeling, he notices that Kojiro looks a bit excited. Motioning with his practice sword, Tenki issues a challenge to the new opponent. Running away, Kojiro gives off the impression that he's too scared to fight. However, the young man returns shortly after, as he needed his own weapon before jumping in. Happy to have someone to duel with, Kojiro can barely contain himself. Unfortunately for Tenki, he isn't familiar with traditional rules, taking a wild swing to start the match. Exchanging proper blows, Tenki has his pride on the line, but the other kid is simply having a good time. As the fight continues, Kojiro's opponent can't believe how skilled he is with the irregular blade. Taking more hits than he expected, Tenki is forced to surrender. After the match, the loser wants to know Kojiro's name, but remembers that he can't hear. Mouthing the words of his request, the deaf boy writes the characters in the sand. Making a proper introduction, the opponent does the same for him. Impressed with his ability, Tenki is hopeful that Kojiro will teach him how to be strong. Cementing their friendship, Tenki demands respect for his new master from the others. Waiting to get started on training, the disciple finds out just how hefty Kojiro's blade is. Wondering how he managed to get that strong, Tenki doesn't realize that constant swimming has given his master some good muscle. Later being brought to meet his disciple's father, Kojiro takes note of a missing body part. Apparently, a man named Fudo is responsible, and Tenki wants to get stronger for revenge against him. Heading further into the village, the two boys see Jisai asking for a small bit of charity. Telling the hermit to get lost, the group starts casually insulting him, amazed he would be so bold. Seeing these same expressions before, Kojiro is now fully aware of what they actually mean. Returning to the beach, the two boys continue training together, using the negativity they witnessed to push themselves even harder. During the next few days, Tenki ends up following his master's regimen more closely. Mentioning an important plan of attack, the boy wonders where Kojiro's wandered off to. It turns out he isn't too far away, following a butterfly into a nearby cave. However, it appears that one of the village girls is also hiding inside. Seemingly upset about something, the young man isn't sure what to make of the situation. Capturing the butterfly from before, he tries using it to cheer the girl up. While it works for a bit, her tears eventually resume, leaving Kojiro at a loss. Wiping her tears away, the boy tries a more physical approach to comforting her. This appears to work a little better, but not sure if he wants to take things further, Kojiro backs away. Successful to some degree, he leaves the girl alone, returning to where Tenki is. Going over the battle plan, the boys confirm their strategy against Fudo, preparing to attack him that night. Stopping by Jisai's place for some food, the small hut is empty, aside from a certain article that hasn't been seen for quite some time. Recognizing the long katana from his childhood, Kojiro is happy to be reunited with his old friend. Thinking this new weapon gives them a better chance of winning, Tenki is reaffirmed in his conviction. Finding a piece of paper underneath the sword, the boy is left with a small note, simply reading, Thank you. Not sure what to make of this, Kojiro puts it out of his mind for the time being. Leaving with Tenki, the two boys make their way to the target under the pale moonlight. Not wanting to deal with his blade's cumbersome scabbard, Kojiro tosses it aside. Giving it back to him, Tenki confidently tells him they aren't going to die, so he should be prepared to put the sword back where it belongs. Arriving at their destination, the duo puts the plan into action. Making a small fire, they use it to ignite Fudo's residence, announcing the danger to lure him out. Sure enough, the man in question evacuates the building, narrowly dodging a blow from Tenki's wooden boken. Checking behind him, Fudo finds himself in the middle of a pincer attack. Not shaken by this development, the man walks back inside of the burning house, shocking the other two. Unflinchingly, the swordsman returns outside, blade in hand. Yelling loudly, Tenki foolishly announces his next strike. Effortlessly flipped onto his back, the young warrior is now on the receiving end of the man's weapon. Curious why these kids have it out for him, Tenki reveals his motivation. Not wanting to kill his opponent, Fudo is more interested in leaving scars to intimidate his would-be attacker. Fiercely crying out, Kojiro quickly slashes at the man in front of him, driving him away from his friend. Not particularly impressed with the movement, Fudo's opinion gradually changes when he notices one of his hands has gone missing. Realizing what he's done, Kojiro starts feeling the full weight of the sword covered in blood. Tying his arm off with part of his outfit, Fudo takes the missing limb in stride. 
Readjusting to his new circumstances, the man swings his blade a number of times, gradually finding a stance that suits him. Having expected another attack while he was readjusting, Fudo can see that Kojiro is full of hesitation now. Knocking the young fighter off balance, the older man readies a second blow, freeing the long katana from the boy's grip. Catching the handle in his teeth, Fudo becomes the new owner of the irregular sword. Having it pointed at him now, Kojiro is brought to tears by the turn of events. Suddenly, Jisai jumps out of the shadows, ready to attack the one threatening his son. While this event seemingly comes out of nowhere, the father is more involved in the situation than you might think. Going back to just before Kojiro gets bullied by the children of the village, the men of the area meet with the elder to discuss a problem. Namely, the supplies meant to go to Fudo are lacking, and time is running out. Apparently, the swordsman was actually a good Samaritan, saving everyone from bandits a number of years ago. Unfortunately, the samurai spun this in his favor, demanding food and women for his service. More than willing to use violence to get what he wants, Tenki's father lost his arm to Fudo after asking for sympathy towards the village. Kusaku, the man who helped raise Kojiro during his early years, also faces the impending issue of offering his daughter as tribute. With the men mostly in agreement, the elder decides that their dues have been paid. That said, they still need someone who could challenge Fudo and actually win. With no one able to fill the role, the old man has an idea that just might work. Elsewhere, while Kojiro can freely catch fish, Jisai is having a hard time keeping himself fed. Hoping for charity from Kusaku, the man receives it, but gets told that resources are hard to come by now thanks to their current situation. Heading outside, Jisai accidentally bumps into Orin, the father's eldest daughter. Left on his own, Kusaku continues to worry, knowing it's only a matter of time before he loses her. Returning home, Jisai meets a stranger who seems to be familiar with him. Pulling a sword from inside of his cane, the elder wants to see if the master can still defend himself. Awkwardly charging forward, the old man's blade connects, though the samurai minimized the damage as best he could. As his thoughts become clouded with the number of moves he could make, Jisai remains locked in place, unsure of the right decision. Forcing himself to move before he's injured again, the master anticipates the sword's movement, taking it for a counterattack. Having his beard cleanly shaved off, the elder has seen everything he needs to. Falling to his knees, he begs Jisai for help in dealing with their issue. Properly introducing himself, the elder apologizes for keeping his intentions hidden. Having his wound tended to, Jisai is offered a handsome reward if he can defeat Fudo in combat. Accepting the offer, the old man's plan is in motion, though he's left out something crucial on purpose. Reconvening with the men of the village, the elder's idea is met with criticism, but this is quickly put to rest as the true motive comes to light. Jisai only has to be successful enough, as the death of Fudo is top priority. Priority. If the former master is cut down as well, then the money that was offered can be easily retrieved. Left alone, Jisai becomes curious about his opponent, but these thoughts fade as he loses enthusiasm. Begging for a small amount of food, the man is declined, despite him supposedly being the savior of the village. Returning to an empty house, Jisai notes Kojiro's absence, not being aware of his son's training regimen. Reminiscing a few years back, the samurai is already glorifying the past. Happy to live for his son, Jisai is still doing his best to be a decent father. Deciding against the dangerous mission, the man wants to remain by Kojiro's side. Receiving more food from Kusaku the next day, Jisai is apologetic as usual. However, this time around, the neighbor invites the samurai in for a meal. Afterwards, the father begs Jisai to follow through with his battle against Fudo, but the former master has already made up his mind. Then again, learning that Kusaku's daughter is going to be taken away if nothing is done, the man's conviction wavers. Interrupting the discussion, a stranger approaches from the distance. Absolutely covered in scars, Jisai is finally introduced to the vicious swordsman Fudo. Immediately heading for Kusaku's house, the shirtless man is ready to claim the girl that was promised to him. Looking at Fudo's back, Jisai wonders if he'd actually be able to take this person in a fight. Answering the question in moments, the scarred samurai faces the former master, blade fully drawn and ready to strike. Not even realizing what happened, Jisai gets pushed aside as Fudo continues to search the area. Moving into the fields, the swordsman catches wind of an odd scent nearby. His intuition ends up being on the money, with Orin doing her best to hide her presence. 
Despite this, he grows tired of the hunt, allowing the girl to breathe easy for the time being. Unfortunately, it seems this reprieve won't last for long, as the one meant to protect her has been mentally shaken. Crushed by the other man's pressure, the village's would-be savior collapses into himself. Following this encounter with Fudo, Kusaku becomes disheartened, knowing it isn't right to send Jisai after the enemy. However, the very next thing the older man says reignites a glimmer of hope in the father's heart. Knowing how much it would hurt to have his own child taken away, Jisai wants to prevent someone else from experiencing that pain. He attempts to ease his nerves by downing an entire bottle of sake, but thanks to his anxiety, the samurai can't feel the effects of the alcohol whatsoever. Mentioning his time spent chasing the way of the sword, he knows that path has left him broken, but he still wants to do something that will have made his life worthwhile. Accepting his fate, Jisai wants Kisaku to finish raising Kojiro. Unlike the other instances, this time, the swordsman won't be returning. Making one last stop at his house, Jisai uncovers Kojiro's old blade, as well as his own weapons that had been sealed away for countless years. Recalling the journey of his past, fear briefly overtakes him, fully understanding what he's getting himself into. Regardless, the man recovers shortly after, taking the time to sharpen the blades that have grown dull with age. Thinking about Kojiro's younger days, the father can't help but shed a few tears. Leaving the long katana for his son, Jisai says his goodbyes, heading to his final destination. Meeting with the other men of the village, the samurai makes a request for them to finish off the enemy if he can't do it himself. Agreeing to this, the elder has other plans, not willing to sacrifice his people for the sake of an outsider. Preparing for the fight, Jisai freezes up, becoming more nervous when he realizes he can't grip his sword properly. Having second thoughts, he's pushed forward by the cold gaze of the Elder. While the Savior manages to get himself going, the terror of his situation continues to hold him back. He knows the villagers are losing their patience, but Jisai can't shake the Tao locking him in place. Very close now, the men notice something off about Fudo's residence. Suddenly, a familiar voice yells out from the distance, one that Jisai is all too familiar with. Taking off in a sprint, the samurai feels the weight of his circumstances completely vanish. Assuming the worst, Jisai gets ready for a fight. Entering the fray, the swordsman is hell-bent on protecting his son. Seeing Tenki's injured body, his older brother feels a sense of urgency as well. Trying to attack from behind, Fudo swipes his leg out from underneath him. Using the distraction to his advantage, Jisai pushes Kojiro away from the battle. Turning to his opponent, the father is ready to finish what he started. Still a bit rusty, Jisai takes a blow to his right arm. Thankfully, the injury is shallow, and the adrenaline from the pain starts to kick in. Forcefully headbutting Fudo back, Jisai uses the distance to get a clean hit on his adversary. Staggering from the impact, the scarred warrior stands his ground, launching a fierce counterattack with exceptional speed. Unfortunately for him, it isn't good enough, with Jisai anticipating this move. Slicing right through Fudo's neck, the battle ends in an instant. Amazed by the display, the villagers can't believe the old man actually managed to finish him off. While they're certainly impressed, no one is more astonished than Kojiro, never seeing his father fight like this until now. Thrilled with the outcome, the young man reclaims his sword from Fudo, going on to take a revenge swing against the former opponent. Indulging himself in the victory, Kojiro coldly smiles as he readies another strike. Aggravated with the boy's lack of respect, Jisai angrily swats him away from the corpse. Following Kojiro's example, the villagers take the opportunity to get their own blows in, fed up with the years of tyranny. Staring in disbelief, Jisai wonders if he's being hypocritical. Regardless, the man is reminded of his own situation as the pain from his arm gets worse. Thinking back to the fight, Jisai fully acknowledges his opponent, glad he only got off with a minor injury. Remembering Fudo's missing arm, the father wonders what Kojiro is doing here in the first place. Letting these thoughts drift away, Jisai finally loses consciousness. After the news of Fudo's death spreads around, the villagers throw a festival that same night. While everyone's enjoying themselves, Jisai is busy recovering, bearing the pain as best he can. The man performed admirably, but his arm paid the price, potentially bringing his fighting days to an end. 
praising the samurai, the elder celebrates like he never had ulterior motives. Offering a sizable house to the winner of the duel, the villagers are more than happy to give it away. Standing to his feet, Jisai cynically comments on the role of savior jumping to the next person in line. Knowing that the past may repeat itself if he's not careful, the man grabs his son and the two head home where they belong. Passing Kusaku and his family along the way, Jisai is shown gratitude for his heroic actions. Exhausted after the day's proceedings, the duo finds it difficult to relax. Kojiro can't stop thinking about the arm he sliced off of Fudo. Replaying it in slow motion, the moment becomes burned into his memory. Jisai has similar thoughts, stuck in the fierce battle with his opponent. Feeling Kojiro lie down next to him, the man understands how shaken his son must be. Putting this night behind them, they finally manage to get to sleep. One year later, the waves are the same as ever. What has changed is Jisai's formerly empty school. Thanks to his duel against Fudo, the master is no longer retired. Among his best students is Tenki, growing considerably stronger with each lesson. Admiring the savior of the village, the young man is determined to become a great samurai like him. While he's able to beat the other adults, there's still one more opponent he's yet to defeat. Starting a match, Tenki charges forward, but gets swiftly dodged by Kojiro. Using his sharp eyes effectively, the deaf swordsman can easily gauge the distance of incoming strikes. Slapping Tenki's wrist, the duel comes to a close. Unable to land a single hit, the class favorite still has a long way to go. Elsewhere, Jisai is helping Kusaku with his farming, but continues to deal with the lingering pain from his old injury. Returning home, the man finds Kojiro bowing in front of the house. Looking expectedly towards his father, the young warrior is met with a cold refusal. What Jisai is referring to is the way of the sword. Even after the intense battle with Fudo, Kojiro remained interested in fighting, using that experience to become stronger. Unfortunately, Jisai has no plans to develop his son's ability in any way, to the point of forbidding him to join in with the other students of the dojo. Sensing some kind of madness lingering within, the boy's father intends to keep it sealed away. He even went as far as hiding his son's blade again, not taking any chances. Forcing a duel, Kojiro takes a wild swing with his stick, but Jisai was expecting this outcome. Picking one up for himself, the man blocks with his good arm, keeping pace with his son. Getting pushed back, Kojiro takes a solid blow to the stomach, ending their impromptu battle. Lying on the ground with a smile, another word from the young man's childhood comes into his mind, displaying the characters for strong. Kojiro may have lost, but he's far from discouraged, wanting to conquer this high-level opponent. Later that night, Jisai comments on how noisily his son eats his food, reminded that he'll never be able to experience that auditory sensation. Teaching Kojiro how to verbally say his father's name, the elder man hopes this lesson will continue to expand the boy's understanding of the world around him. With Jisai falling asleep soon after, Kojiro takes the opportunity to do his nightly training. Projecting the battle against Fudo onto his surroundings, the young swordsman uses this to push himself beyond his limits. The days carry on, with Kojiro continuing to be refused training from Jisai. Spending time with Tenki, the deaf samurai watches as his friend writes a message, stating his dream of becoming invincible under the sun. Having someone else in mind, the declaration reminds Kojiro of his father, currently the strongest in his eyes. Coming home for the day, Jisai prepares himself for the usual challenge from his son. Oddly, no one's waiting in front of the house. Taking in the surroundings, the man eventually catches the boy as he launches a surprise attack from above. Landing on his back, Jisai hits the enemy's face from behind, going on to throw the challenger elsewhere. Quickly recovering, Kojiro dodges the old man's next strike. Unfortunately, a single block from Jisai leaves the deaf swordsman open for a finishing blow. Acknowledging the boy's skill, the master still refuses to go any further with his training. Knowing the painful reality of the sword, Jisai is fully aware that many who follow the path are cut down mercilessly. As the seasons continue to pass, many more years come and go. Returning home after his usual farming activities, Jisai is significantly older now. Waiting in the same place he usually is, Kojiro prepares to challenge his father. Quite a bit larger now, the 17-year-old has trained himself extensively at this point. Regardless, the old man is more than used to the combat, still not budging after all this time. While the outcome of this fight isn't seen, the end result is most likely the same as it's always been. 
With the Battle of Sekigahara fast approaching, soldiers cross the once peaceful beach of the small village. The local farmers have taken notice, knowing the state of affairs will only continue to get worse. Not much caring about which side they're on, the villagers prepare for the inevitable fallout. On the other side of things, Temki is desperate to get involved with the war, full of confidence from his training regimen. Although he's the number one disciple of Jisai, the man still has one more opponent to conquer. Taking a mighty swing, Tenki is defeated by a single stroke. He may be strong, but he's not the only one who's developed his technique. A few days later, the father and son duo is in the middle of another match. Being pushed harder than usual, Jisai uses the rain to keep himself hidden. Not able to properly fight under the heavy downpour, the old man knows that for Kojiro, every day is just like this. Forced to deal with this immense handicap, the son is about to learn the hard way how quickly a fight can end. However, being used to his lack of hearing, Kojiro feels out the dangerous presence behind him. Unfortunately, it's not quite enough, as Jisai uses a trick to blind the other swordsman. Forcing him to the ground, the old samurai continues his winning streak. Putting forth countless reasons that could cost Kojiro his life, Jisai wants to teach his son that even something minute could result in death. Having the opposite effect, Kojiro pushes himself relentlessly to improve his technique. Using a heavily weighted training stick, the man is determined to win against his father. Being a little too enthusiastic, the son wakes up a samurai trying to get some sleep. Recognizing the one making a racket, it seems Itoito Sai has made another trip to see his master. Seeing how far the boy has come, the former disciple is thrilled to say the least. The next day, Tenki is making his way through the village when something undesirable catches his eye. Being accosted by a group of bandit soldiers, the samurai wonders how they'll survive the war when they're so outmatched. Walking past them, the leader angrily gives chase, only for Tenki to reveal just who they're dealing with. While this encounter went quite smoothly, the next man he encounters seems to be far more dangerous. Passing each other, Tenki tries to feel out his would-be adversary, unable to find a single opening. It seems that Itosai felt the man's intense energy, as he immediately attributes it to Jisai's teachings. Claiming to be his number one disciple, Tenki is corrected by the wandering samurai, surprised that someone else has already taken the rank. Elsewhere, the two family members are busy with their usual routine. As Jisai attempts the same trick twice, Kojiro dodges the unorthodox attack. Feeling cocky, the deaf swordsman nearly gets his finger broken from losing focus. Narrowly avoiding this, Kojiro shoves the old man away. Quickly regaining his balance, Jisai swipes at the boy, following through with a bigger swing. Despite him missing his target, the old man has already won. Pushed back from his father's pressure, the son falls prey to a trap that had been set up earlier. Showing Kojiro another way he could end up dead, Jisai is once again the victor. Noticing an additional spectator, the two become aware of Itosai, quite pleased with his master's efforts. That said, the former disciple can see what the old man is trying to do. Dropping a heavy truth, Itosai knows that rather than these lessons being for Kojiro's sake, they're actually for Jisai's. Feeling the similarities they share, the wandering samurai can see the insane potential beneath the surface. Told to leave, Itosai mentions how cruel it is forcing a tiger to live as a house cat. Walking up to Kojiro, the man strikes him across the face with a stick. Revealing another secret, Itosai is aggravated that the young samurai is holding back his true power. This leaves Jisai utterly shocked, unsure how true the statement is. Finding out within moments, the old man watches Kojiro retaliate with ridiculous speed. Being tackled to the ground, Itosai removes the assailant with a single kick. Securing the boy in a headlock, the samurai has proven his point, infinitely happy with the results. Understandably, Jisai isn't, leaving Itosai no choice but to return to the beach for the night. While initially calm, the silence is broken as the traveler senses a group of men approaching. As they call out to him, the samurai gets ready to run, but stops himself as he hears Kojiro heading outside for his regular training. Using this to his advantage, Itosai hides elsewhere, resulting in the two parties coming into contact. Hoping for a fight, the swordsman gets ready to see some fireworks. Unfortunately, nothing much happens, with no one pushing for a fight. That said, it seems that Kojiro has a certain desire welling up inside of him. Itching to test himself, the deaf samurai is looking for a challenge. The spectator knows all too well what Kojiro wants, expecting something to change any second now. 
Again letting the man down, Kojiro decides to get back to work, not having the aggression to pursue the group. Tired of this passive stance, Ito side jumps from his perch, loudly shouting to forcibly get things started himself. Within moments, the group returns back to the scene. Using the little time he's got left, Ito side channels a wave of killing energy towards the oblivious Kojiro. Feeling this animosity, the young samurai turns around to find the source. Reaffirming his opinion, Itosai can't wait for this new tiger to show his claws. Using a stack of paper, the man labels his pursuers with different point values. While each of them only ranks in the single digits, Itosai gives himself a whopping 10,000 points, ready to take on any challenger in this game of death he's created. Unsure of what's going on, Kojiro watches intently, wondering what the strange man is planning. The group then clarifies why they've been chasing after the prestigious swordsman, with each of them hoping for a fair match. Among them, the largest man is confused why he was the only one that didn't receive a score. With lightning speed, Itosai shoves his fingers into the challenger's nose, throwing him to the ground with little effort. Angered by this, he tries to use his status to gain respect, only for Itosai to laugh in his face. Not caring who his father is, the opponent is belittled for the display. Becoming deathly serious, Itosai warns the man to take his situation more urgently. Not having any time to react, the adversary is pushed back by a small stick. As another man gets ready to strike, Itosai kills this momentum with a fierce glare. Commenting on the babysitter that's ready to attack in his place, the formidable samurai finally tells the sizable challenger why he's lacking in points. With only a couple of moves, Itosai has gained complete control of the area, leaving the others intimidated by his power. Climbing back up the rocks, the man instructs them all to fight to the death. Wanting to see some blood, Itosai states that only the winner is worthy of challenging him. Initially dumbfounded by this declaration, one of the group eventually decides to indulge it. Finding another who's willing to join, the loser lands right at Kojiro's feet. Watching from a distance the entire time, the spectator's urge to prove himself has only grown. Looking at the blade of the deceased, the young samurai decides to pick it up. Standing on guard, the previous adversary is ready for his next opponent. Regrettably, it only takes a single slash for him to be completely disemboweled. Looking back to the deaf swordsman, the gutless individual sees a monster. Approaching the rest of the men, the young samurai brandishes a smile. Officially cutting down his first opponent, the seal has been broken. Introducing himself as Takata, the next challenger waits to hear the name of his adversary. Unable to oblige him, Kojiro charges straight ahead. Being met with a large swing, the defender retaliates, slicing through Takata's right arm. As the larger man becomes the following target, he's utterly shocked at Kojiro's innocent gaze. Expecting some kind of heavy emotion, the nervous fighter can only see a sense of childlike wonder. Realizing his sword is bent, Kojiro tosses it aside, facing his opponent without a weapon. Told this is a rash decision, the deaf samurai has no reason to worry, as the sizable adversary hasn't stopped shaking since the conflict began. Walking right up to the man, Kojiro boldly grabs his short sword. Punished for his hesitation, the costly mistake now has the nervous individual staring at the other end of his own blade. Things may be going well for Kojiro, but at this point, Itosai has seen enough, jumping from his perch. Watching the young man's progression, a certain fatal flaw has made itself apparent. Namely, Kojiro hasn't reacted to the carnage going on around him in the slightest. While most people would find the violence somewhat unsettling, the deaf swordsman isn't the least bit shaken by it. This lack of involvement will only serve to get him killed, but rather than watch Kojiro throw his life away, Itosai has a solution in mind to fix his way of thinking. Stabbing the reckless warrior through the leg, the elder samurai is ready to deliver a much needed lesson. Dumbfounding the others, the men become curious about the relationship the two share. Answering promptly, Itosai makes it clear that he's disciplining another student, 
Stepping away for the time being, the seasoned warrior finally puts Kojiro's first victim out of his misery, shocking the duelist who's not used to these customs. Returning to his junior, Ito ominously prepares to educate the injured man. Kojiro makes an attempt to get revenge, only to have his leg wound harshly stomped on. Receiving more blows, the deaf samurai does his best to guard his limb from more damage. Being overpowered, Kojiro quickly has a sense of fear driven in. Pushing him back even more, Ito Sai won't let him forget this lesson anytime soon. Seeing the headless man next to him, Kojiro gradually remembers Takuan's warning from when he was a child. Finally easing up, Ito Sai knows that he's proven his point. Patching up the injury, the senior disciple sends his junior back into the fray. Unable to comprehend this strange display of trust, the others continue to grow more uneasy. Not wanting to accept the advantage, the large samurai tries to show mercy, but Kojiro is in the middle of acclimating to the pain. Taking a page out of Fudo's book, the deaf swordsman takes a bit of time to readjust his stance. Getting used to the handicap, Kojiro is prepared to fight again. Thrilled by this development, Ito Sai cheers for his companion, happy to see him grow further. With his tenacity killing the opponent's enthusiasm, the fighter wonders what he can do to match the young man's passion. Getting distracted, the adversary narrowly dodges a strike from Kojiro, but gets a slight reprieve as his injury acts up again. Thinking he managed to get enough distance, the samurai is surprised to see that the attack actually connected. As he contemplates the things he's missing, Kojiro uses the opportunity to sanitize his wound with seawater. Watching him push through this suffering, Ito Sai knows that the earlier lesson has been acknowledged. While this fear may be a slight obstacle, Kojiro still isn't worried about his opponent. Constantly bouncing back, the deaf swordsman has the challenger frozen in place. Locked in a battle of morals, the large warrior can't wrap his head around Kojiro's motivation. As the stress builds to a breaking point, the man makes a last-ditch effort to intimidate his adversary with his status. Sadly, this move has no effect, as Itosai informs him that Kojiro can't hear anything. With the desperate words falling to the waves, the samurai realizes the depth of his shame. Making a rash decision, he follows Itosai's example, stabbing himself in the leg. Trading pain for determination, the swordsman has freed himself from the shackles of kindness. Fiercely crying out, the man is finally ready to start the fight. Happy to oblige him, Kojiro meets this resolve with a wide smile. Despite being pushed back by the large man, Kojiro maintains his smile. Initially confused by this, the adversary now understands, knowing the deaf swordsman is enjoying their exchange of skill. Respecting his love towards the killing art, the opponent tells Kojiro how brave he is. However, the sizable warrior is aware that this passion may be the death of him. Thanks to Kojiro's sword being shorter in length, the challenger narrowly held on to his life. Shifting to a more traditional stance, the man is going to put everything he has into single movements. With powerful form, the opposing samurai cuts through Kojiro's arm. Luckily, the slice was only partial, leaving the man's limb intact. Quickly moving into the next strike, the large adversary is blocked, though not entirely, with the sword leaving a gash in Kojiro's shoulder. Filled with his own sense of excitement, the swordsman is grateful that life led him to this moment. That said, the fight won't last for much longer, as both warriors have lost too much blood. One more attack will be enough to bring things to a close. Suddenly, Kojiro starts making odd noises, going back and forth with the tones. Not sure what to make of this, the opponent wonders what this odd form of singing is supposed to be. Listening for long enough, Ito Sai figures out the origin of the sounds. Using the environment he's familiar with, Kojiro strikes as the tide goes out. Jumping to change his stance, the samurai lands with the waves crashing in, using his sword to carry the momentum. Ending things with a powerful blow, the duel is over. Standing as the victor, Kojiro performed exceptionally. Understandably, his consciousness finally gives out, having his fall stopped by Itosai. Pleased with the fantastic show, the senior disciple couldn't be more proud of his junior. 
Unbeknownst to him, another spectator had been watching these developments. Before the killing had even started, Jisai was still asleep in his house. Lost in a dream, the master recalls the day that Ito Sai left his original school. Seeming to come from a place of arrogance, the disciple is more disheartened than anything. Explaining his tears, the man is upset that he's apparently hit his skill ceiling. Not having proper opponents to face off against, Ito Sai wonders if he'll ever find someone worth his time. Thinking about these words, Jisai draws a parallel to an experience that just happened. Learning that Kojiro had apparently been holding back his power, the father realizes that his son's expression is similar to the one seeking stronger opponents. Scaring himself with his revelation, Jisai wakes up from his dream with a start. Looking over to the other futon, the man sees that it's empty. Heading into the woods, Jisai searches for the missing son. Knowing how kind-hearted the boy is, the father is worried that Kojiro may cross a line he can't come back from. Eventually hearing the larger samurai's battle cries, Jisai makes his way to the source. Arriving at the beach, the man is just in time to witness the end of the duel. Changing immensely in just one night, the son is barely recognized by his father. Bringing Kojiro back to his home, Itosai mentions the number of opponents the boy cut down. Saddened by the news, Jisai knows that he can't hold his son back any longer. While Itosai praises the father for his exceptional work, these words have the opposite effect on the old man. The disciple is pleased with the swordsmanship that brought Kojiro to this point, but Jisai is upset that he contributed to this eventuality. Knowing that his son has unlimited potential, the man has no choice but to set the budding samurai free on his journey. Bowing to his disciple, Jisai leaves Kojiro in Itosai's hands. Throughout the following days, the old man prepares medicine for the son still recovering from his injuries. Looking down at him, the father remembers all of the time he spent raising the boy. Jisai did everything he could to keep the family members safe and away from the sword, but sadly, it seems destiny has other plans. Crying tears of regret, the father is forced to let go. Eventually, Kojiro gets healthy again, ready to leave the village with Itosai. However, as he says the name of his father, the deaf swordsman sheds a few tears, having his own memories with the old master. Regardless, it's time for him to go. With only a handful of belongings, Kojiro heads out, curious about the new world he's jumping into. Now left to his own devices, Jisai returns to the rocks overlooking the sea. Leaving his original sword behind, it seems Kojiro found more value in the man that awakened his inner tiger. Throwing the sword back into the water, this time, Jisai doesn't go after it. Walking along the beach, the old samurai encounters one of the men from the group Kojiro faced off against. Despite his loss, the large swordsman also managed to survive. Being asked the meaning of the sword, the master can't give a proper answer, still agonizing over his involvement with that world. Surprising him, the other man claims that the two duelists had a conversation during the fight. Communicating through the blade, the men apparently talked about a number of things. Thinking back, Jisai had the same experience with his son. Granted, this wasn't just once, but numerous times throughout his life. Sparring constantly over the years, both opponents learned plenty about each other, forming a bond with their swordsmanship. Even the sizable challenger felt close to the deaf samurai after a single match. This kind of connection certainly isn't normal for a first time encounter, and Jisai understands this all too well. Climbing to the top of the tallest rock, the man finally feels that he made the right decision following this path. Not only did the sword bring Jisai to this point, but it allowed him to finally connect with someone. Thanks to his own passion for the blade, Kojiro reinvigorated his father's love of the art. Leaving behind an amazingly talented swordsman, Jisai finally has something, as well as someone, to be proud of. Writing a certificate of swordsmanship, the old master leaves it to Tenki to eventually deliver the scroll. Heading out on his own journey, the friend knows it won't be hard to find Kojiro along the way. Unfortunately, this never happens, as we see the man get killed at a certain construction site. At the very least, the scroll does make it into Kojiro's hands, in a manner of speaking. Returning to his house, Jisai removes the papers that have been plastered on his walls for years. Finishing the job he started, the man can finally say that he's lived a full life. Elsewhere, the pair of travelers are in the middle of a break. Needing to use the bathroom, Itosai leaves his money with Kojiro. This doesn't go unnoticed, as the young man gets accosted by a small group of thugs. Not sure what to make of this, Kojiro eventually gets a signal that they want to fight. Kicking down the first opponent, 
The deaf swordsman takes the opportunity to grab his blade. As he looks over to the others, they can't help but notice the innocent look in the young man's eyes. The bandits assume that Kojiro hasn't killed anyone, giving him the chance to leave before he gets cut down. Starting a countdown before they charge him, the men are shocked when the samurai instantly closes the gap. Swiftly dodging a wide swing, Kojiro snaps back with his own strike, forcing the attacker to surrender. Disarming the remaining foe, the swordsman brings the conflict to an end. Watching from a distance, Itosai notices the developed senses of his junior, eliminating any handicap he may have suffered. Unable to state his name, the traveling companion does it for him, giving Kojiro the start of his fame. Heading for a tapestry shop, Itosai makes a special declaration for his partner, reading Sasaki Kojiro, Invincible Swordsman Under the Heavens. Doubling as a fight invitation, the banner allows the deaf man to introduce himself with no issue. Using his demeanor as an additional descriptor, Kojiro's full title is established. Walking through town, the flashy advertisement gets them plenty of looks. Eventually, they come across another person brandishing a similar getup. Calling out to him, Itosai wants to see a battle between two seemingly invincible men. Going by Muso Gonosuke, the martial artist has a hard time accepting Kojiro's odd style. Thinking he's just trying to earn himself a job, Gon is making a declaration of himself to the world. Convinced that Itosai is the one announcing his power, the young fighter insults him, saying it'll only serve to make people like him look foolish. Not taking kindly to being looked down on, the old samurai decides to show the cocky stranger who he's dealing with. Using the very weapon Gon proudly carries around, Itosai easily knocks him out, not being the least bit generous with his rating. Leaving the defeated warrior on the ground, the duo moves on, taking another break after walking a considerable distance. Interrupting their peace and quiet, Gon makes another appearance, catching back up in no time at all. Driving two practice swords into the ground, the martial artist acknowledges his defeat, wanting a chance to redeem himself in a fair fight. Finally clearing things up, Itosai reveals the actual swordsman looking for a challenge. Picking up one of the weapons, Kojiro is ready to take on his new opponent. Within a few moves, Kojiro has the upper hand. However, something about Gon's energy feels different, almost like it's lacking something crucial. Seeing the fighter's next move, everything becomes clear in an instant. Finishing the match, Kojiro's expression is anything but satisfied. Leaving it at that, the deaf samurai turns away from his opponent, getting ready to leave with his companion. Discouraging the martial artist further, Itosai claims that Gon has a lot of improving to do. Losing twice now, the boy is desperate to improve his skill. Dusting himself off, Gon makes his way back to the duo. Not knowing who the older man is, the boy is shocked to find another legend casually wandering around. Determined to join them now, Gon mentions his own dream of being a legendary fighter like Itosai. Stopping at a restaurant, the new apprentice notices just how aloof Kojiro is in general. Interrupting their meal, a skilled swordsman noticed the invincible banner they left outside, wanting to see for himself if the claim is true. Hoping to make things more interesting, Itosai puts forth an additional stipulation, with the opponent agreeing to the addition. Handing the young man a sword, the senior disciple motions over to the challenger, letting him know it's time to fight again. As they head outside, Itosai explains the true nature of dueling to Gon, mentioning a willingness to die an honorable death. Despite Kojiro being deaf and mute, this path inevitably chose him, and he has no choice but to follow it. While Kojiro can handle this, Gon is leagues away from risking his life. As he watches the stranger draw his sword, Kojiro follows suit, getting ready to defend himself. Stepping into attack, the adversary moves fast, but Kojiro is already gone by the time he swings. Before he knows it, the duel is already over. Silently told that he was a good opponent, the stranger passes on feeling satisfied. This may be the case for him, but the lone spectator can't even begin to grasp this dedication. Suddenly, Kojiro starts talking to him, telling Gon he's not worth killing due to his lack of conviction. Waking up with a start, it seems that the martial artist was in the middle of a dream. Regardless, the message felt clear, and Gon knows that he has to work on his commitment. As Itosai gets busy with some female company, Kojiro heads elsewhere in the middle of the night. Chasing after him, Gon discovers the deaf samurai training in a nearby river. Impressed by his diligence, the martial artist wants to learn from Kojiro's example. Once he's ready, he'll challenge the swordsman again. 
That said, there's nothing stopping the inexperienced fighter from getting in some practice rounds. Unfortunately, Kojiro still isn't interested in battling Gon, even less so after his training session. Not wanting to be ignored, the apprentice tries getting in a sneak attack for a bit of revenge. Unbeknownst to him, Kojiro can sense this negative energy approaching from behind. Defending himself, the man knocks the aggressor out with a single blow. Later waking up in an empty room, Gon learns that his companions have left without him. Running after them once again, the martial artist eventually finds them at Sekigahara. Potentially wanting to join in, Itosai is disappointed to find that the important battle has already ended. While everyone present is out of commission, one lone soldier managed to hold on to his life. Getting a closer look, it appears that a familiar swordsman is still looking to cut his teeth on the battlefield. Angered that he missed all the action, the warrior falls to his knees, crying out amidst the sea of corpses. Sensing the presence of the other three, he quickly jumps to attention. Waltzing right up to the group, the young man tries to determine what side these strangers are on. Being told they're merely observers, the samurai takes his leave without incident. Walking amongst the deceased, Gon recalls how his dream used to be joining a battle like this to gain fame and stable work. Realizing he could have easily been more food for the crows, he's grateful things didn't work out in his favor. Suddenly, another group makes an appearance, demanding to know who they are. Looking for a fight, the two swordsmen are ready to take them on. That said, they're going to have to wait their turn, as a certain someone makes a beeline for the soldiers. Kicking things off, the man from before slams against one of the horsemen in spectacular fashion. Following his lead, Kojiro takes on a different opponent. However, as these foes are wearing armor, they'll take a few more hits to bring down. Nevertheless, the deaf samurai quickly adapts to the situation, hitting a vital spot to keep things brief. Even Gon manages to land himself a kill, staying loose during the fight. This hardly settles things, as Itosai excitedly calls more soldiers over to the party. Gon nearly gets overwhelmed by the next wave, until the wild swordsman saves him from a premature end. Asking his name, we're properly introduced to Shinmen Takizo. Shocked by his expression, Gon is amazed that he can laugh in a situation like this. Then again, as he looks around him, it seems that he's the odd one out here. Taking on entire groups by himself, Takezo shows no signs of slowing down. Cutting his way from person to person, the man can't be stopped. Meanwhile, Kojiro encounters another soldier that appears to be taking pity on him. Revealing his true conviction, the deaf samurai knows it's time to take action. Watching the carnage all around him, Itosai observes just how intense the two swordsmen are. At one point, the duo accidentally bumps into each other. Spinning around, they're ready to attack, and for a brief moment, time freezes all around them. Instinctively feeling that neither is a threat to the other, they resume their stance, diving back into the fight. <laughs> Putting a stop to their advance, Takezo takes a bullet to the leg. Walking up to the person responsible for this, Itosai gets ready to make an example of the lone gunman. Removing half of the gun, as well as the soldier's left hand, the samurai makes it very clear that he doesn't like firearms. Intimidating the other opponents with this action, Itosai decides he's had enough fun, telling them to leave. Heeding the man's advice, they quickly evacuate the battlefield. Wondering where Takezo ended up, the trio decides to move on without him. Unfortunately, while this battle may be over, a different kind of hell is waiting for them elsewhere. Following the violent encounter, a soldier who got away from the fighting makes his way through the forest. Coming across a group of villagers, the men can be seen carrying numerous weapons and armor sets. Before he gets the chance to do anything, the deserter is stabbed to death by the others. Acting as refugee hunters, the local men plan to get their revenge on the soldiers that ravaged their homes. Adding more incentive, the group that manages to capture the leader of the losing army gets a juicy bonus. Thanks to this announcement, the villagers swarm the surrounding area en masse. Shortly after, the trio of fighters comes across the soldier from before, with Gon commenting on the circumstances of losing a war. Fully aware that they also look like defeated men, Itosai purposefully brought them into the lion's den. As night falls, the searching intensifies, with the hunters looking everywhere they can. Gathering together in a certain spot, the men set their sights on Kojiro. 
Disregarding his safety, Itosai intentionally left the deaf swordsman behind. Thinking back to his promise with Jisai, the senior disciple knows full well that he can't gauge anyone but himself. Giving Kojiro the only guidance he can, Itosai pushes him into the hardest training he could ever go through. With love and care, the old samurai wants his junior to run the gauntlet and become him. Gon pleads for Itosai to reconsider, but the request isn't entertained in the slightest. Deciding to help Kojiro himself, the martial artist is advised against this, as he wouldn't be able to do much to contribute. Considering this a special kind of battle, Itosai claims that hatred is the only thing pushing these men to kill. There's nothing honorable about these fights. Rather, this test is one of survival. Having their own problems, the other two have no choice but to focus on themselves. The night is long, and no one is coming to help. As morning finally arrives, Kojiro remains standing, but just barely, fighting countless enemies through a sleepless night. Dealing with the trio of villagers, the deaf swordsman violently eliminates the first one. However, the other two see an opening thanks to the samurai beginning to lose consciousness. Inching their way closer, the duo carefully moves forward. Within striking distance, the second man decides to try his luck, resulting in him practically getting cut in half. Operating purely on instinct at this point, even Kojiro is surprised when the attack connects. Watching the young man doze off again, the final adversary takes his chance, only to be finished off with a single stab. Finally catching a breather, Kojiro checks the men for water, only to find empty containers. Looking over, the samurai spots an entirely new group of hunters to deal with. Whatever brief respite he had has been swiftly taken away. Left as the lone survivor, Kojiro's spirit is anything but peaceful. Finally getting a proper break, the swordsman isn't concerned with the new men coming into his territory. Knowing what comes next, Kojiro grabs his sword, ready for the next wave. The soldiers try to run, but it's far too late. With another day and night passing him by, Kojiro makes his way to the top of a nearby mountain. Finishing off a small group of hunters, he notices yet another bunch of warriors heading his way. However, these men have actually been dealing with the same situation. Belonging to the losing side, the faction of soldiers made it their mission to survive long enough to return to their lord Nosaka. Suffering a few casualties, the remaining fighters take on the appearance of ordinary villagers, hoping the disguise will keep them safe. While this does get them out of the woods, it also makes them an enemy of a very dangerous man. That said, the exhausted samurai seems to have something else on his mind, saying a familiar name as he stands to his feet. Pushed to the brink of despair, the only thing the swordsman can think of is the sea by his old village. Remembering the peaceful days he spent on the beach, Jisai immediately comes to mind. Feeling homesick, Kojiro would love nothing more than to return. Unfortunately, those familiar waves are a world away now, and if he wants to survive, he'll need to keep fighting. Reluctantly getting into a stance, Kojiro waits for the next battle. Sadakore, the oldest member of the group, tells the others to leave without him. Knowing he has the least amount of time left to live, he decides to stay behind, not only out of duty, but also out of curiosity. Noticing that Kojiro isn't dropping his guard, the man knows that this fear is indicative of a truly strong opponent. Taking out a weighted chain, Sadakori prepares himself for the inevitable duel. In a matter of moments, two moves are exchanged between the fighters. Backing away, Kojiro took a blow to his left arm, while Sadakore is now missing a finger. Wondering if this battle could have been avoided, the old man rationalizes that his personal interest would have dragged him in regardless. Continuing the match, a quick maneuver from Sadakore disarms the deaf swordsman. Doing his best to dodge, it doesn't take long for Kojiro to receive more damage to his body. Watching the young man retreat behind some rocks, the veteran fighter is almost grateful for this outcome. However, Kojiro continues to stare at his adversary, unable to commit to running away. Sadakore wants him to make a proper choice, stating that this hesitation makes him weak. Returning to the field, Kojiro is ready to get his sword back. Using the clothing of a deceased villager nearby, the man buffs his defense, if only slightly. Finally realizing what ended up drawing him into this fight, Sadakori can sense the inherent beauty of the warrior's complete dedication to the blade. 
As Kojiro attempts to express himself, the old man becomes aware of his adversary's handicap. Commenting on this odd match, Sadakori swears he saw a strange vision during the battle. Understanding the true nature of his opponent, the veteran fighter is grateful to have encountered someone like Kojiro. That said, the old man doesn't plan to lose. Slashing the wrapped arm away, Sadakori gets ready to win the match. Unfortunately, something underneath the barrier is about to draw things to a close. The body that Kojiro found was also carrying a small blade, and the samurai was waiting for the right time to use it. The sneak attack was a risky gamble, but the courageous move doesn't go unnoticed. Left satisfied by the duel, Sadakori is amazed at what Kojiro brought out of him. Falling to the ground, the old man notices that his companions have returned. Joining the path of the sword with him, Sadakori's students ended up bonding with him along the way. With the instructor having acted as a father towards them, the sons won revenge. <coughs> Introducing himself with the name given to him by Sadakore, Kone becomes the next challenger to approach the deaf swordsman. Losing his footing and his blade, Kojiro is shocked at this new warrior's strength. Ready for a hell of a fight, Kone wants his opponent to give it everything he's got. Interrupting the dangerous foe, Kojiro throws a rock, hitting the adversary in one of his eyes. Throwing him off balance, Ko nearly misses his target. Thanks to this, Kojiro takes the opportunity to grapple the man, throwing him onto the ground. Readying a stance, the samurai remembers that his weapon is currently lacking. Eyeing the younger member of the group, Kojiro makes a mad dash towards the one known as Ichizo. Assuming the enemy wants the sword behind him, Ichizo is surprised when the man prevents him from drawing his own blade. Bringing Kojiro to his knees, it doesn't take long before the young fighter is flipped over his shoulder. Writing himself, Ichizo is too late, as both individuals have a weapon now. The others try to warn him not to get involved, but he's also been itching to prove himself. Reminded of their objective, Ichizo claims there's no way their master could have survived all the chaos. Not only that, but being the youngest of the group, he doesn't see himself making it much further. Asking the man's name, they all learn that Kojiro can't hear. Seeming to understand what's being asked of him, the deaf swordsman obliges them. Removing a bloody bandage from his arm, it turns out to be the remainder of his previous banner. Grateful for the introduction, Ichizo is ready to go. Thinking more on why they're all so keen to fight Kojiro, Kone rationalizes that like Sadakore, they've all sensed the truth of their situation. Having nowhere to return, the men want a worthy battle to go out on their own terms. Mirroring these thoughts, Ichizo is satisfied, regardless of how things end. As the match begins, both fighters stare at each other in silence. Unmoving, the standoff continues for an indefinite period of time. Gradually losing his focus, Ichizo's mind becomes clouded with unnecessary thoughts. Regrettably, the one completely used to the silence overtakes the man full of distraction. While he may have lost, Ichizo showed plenty of courage, getting respectfully sent off. Shortly after this match, Kojiro performs a number of slashes by himself. Not understanding this at first, Kone eventually realizes that the deaf samurai discovered a new technique during the previous encounter. Jumping into the next duel with their introductions, the fighters imitate the opening of the earlier battle. Unlike last time, both men are fully concentrating, making very small movements towards each other. Getting a deadly premonition, Kone quickly backs away, narrowly saving himself from death. Having a similar vision, Kojiro is now the one to retreat. However, he's not quite as lucky, sustaining an injury across his leg. Oddly, Kojiro isn't upset by this at all. Walking right up to Kone, he acknowledges the man's talent. Confused by this action, it seems that Kone couldn't predict this due to his opponent not approaching with killing intent. On the contrary, Kojiro is absolutely thrilled with this outcome, happy to have found such a skilled adversary. Watching this odd display, the final group member can't comprehend what he's seeing. Surrounded by killing and despair, Kojiro is having the time of his life. Looking at the big smile on the deaf man's face, the soldier is shocked seeing his deceased comrades also happy in death. Even Kone has become intoxicated by the infectious energy of the duel, ready to continue.
middle of battle, Cone has an epiphany. Taking a few practice swings, the samurai has gotten even faster with his strikes. That said, he's not the only one improving on the fly. Recalling his time as a student, Cone was always amazed at the techniques that would surface from listening to his body's inner voice. Noticing another person occupying the same space, the man gets distracted, taking a minor blow. Looking at the perpetrator, Cone is met with an odd sight. Realizing that this young boy is Kojiro, he understands just how much time the deaf swordsman has spent with the blade. Able to shut out every outside influence, Kojiro trained himself extensively, until his senses were as sharp as the katana he wields. Grateful for such a rare encounter, Kone is left in awe of the master before him. With both men giving it their all, the satisfaction they feel has reached a new level. Eager to get back to the fight, the duo smiles, more than happy with the intense match. With that, the final blows are exchanged. Standing as the lone victor, Kojiro is the one to come out on top. This time in the wilderness has no doubt been invaluable, and the deaf samurai was able to make an amazing friend. Unfortunately, that friend is no longer breathing, and once again, Kojiro is all alone. Going back to the first morning after Kojiro was cut loose, a certain martial artist has collapsed from exhaustion. Springing to attention, Gon is greeted by Itosai, only slightly impressed that his companion managed to survive the ambush. Shedding tears for Kojiro, Gon recalls the circumstances that were heavily stacked against him. Knowing the odds are low, it's hard to say whether the deaf swordsman is alive or not. Mentioning the time he spent in his old village, Gon was hardly welcome, not contributing whatsoever and using his strength to push everyone around. Unsurprisingly, he was completely disregarded by the people around him. Looking to the sky, Gon hopes that somehow, the one person who accepted him is out there somewhere. Eventually, the duo comes across a house, hoping the owner will be kind enough to give them supplies of some kind. Sadly, upon entering, they find that it's been emptied of anything useful. Thinking about Kojiro's situation, Itosai knows that his previous lesson about fear was only the beginning. Hoping to eliminate any remaining numbness, the older man is certain that this journey will drive in the last thing currently missing from his junior. Heading away from the dangerous area, the duo is safe again. Hoping Kojiro was strong enough to make it out, Itosai is aware of just how powerful the deaf samurai may be at this point. Imposing the same trial he went through, the older man knows how valuable the experience was for him. If Kojiro was able to survive, he would truly be on equal footing with Itosai. Pleased with this possibility, the samurai is optimistic for the future. As they continue their travels, Itosai finds himself awake during the early morning hours. Noticing a figure approaching, he smirks as someone familiar walks towards him. Coming down from the mountain, Kojiro finally makes an appearance. However, he's in no mood to mess around. While their battle was short, the tigers clashed violently. In the end, Kojiro is knocked out, and Itosai has lost part of his hand. More than happy with these results, the older samurai awards his opponent 1,000 points. With a smug look of satisfaction, Itosai welcomes the new beast he manufactured. Soon after, Musashi makes his way to Kyoto for a duel against a member of the Yoshioka clan. Accepting the match in his own way, Musashi leaves his mark on the announcement sign. Recovering from his wounds around the same time, Kojiro arrives in town a little later. Amused by the odd handprint covering the board, the deaf man gets assaulted by some of the Yoshioka members for his lack of respect. Dodging the attacks with ease, Kojiro eventually gets bored and walks elsewhere. Ueda, one of the top members of the Yoshioka, receives a report about this strange occurrence. Claiming they were lucky he didn't draw his sword, the man knows exactly who they're dealing with. Remembering the intense battle from four years ago, Ueda is curious why Kojiro would suddenly come to Kyoto. Elsewhere, the leader of the Yoshioka goes for a preemptive attack, wanting to put Musashi down before he causes too much trouble. Failing in this, the winner is left to patch himself up at a nearby river. Running into an older man in the same area, the stranger, going by Honami Koetsu, is curious about the fight he was involved in. 
Being told the loser was the former head of the Yoshioka, the man casually congratulates him on his win. Watching the swordsman barely keep himself upright, Koetsu is eventually asked if he wouldn't mind lending out a place to sleep. Collapsing immediately after, Musashi is brought to the man's estate, healing his wounds for a number of days. At the same time, Koetsu's mother is in the middle of giving a lesson. Using a physical example, the student answers her question quite effectively. Scolding him for his antics, the mother writes down a new inquiry. Giving a quick response, Kojiro is revealed to be living in the estate as well. During Musashi's recovery period, Ueda becomes desperate, hoping for any way to avoid the duel that's been scheduled. Getting an idea for a proxy fighter, the man knows exactly who to ask for help. Kojiro is somewhere in Kyoto, and with the other members' help, the search is on. Describing his features, Ueda gives the men their orders, sending them on their way. Little do they know, Kojiro is much closer than they think, wandering through town with no real destination. Spotting a woman he takes an interest in, the deaf man leads her back to the estate. Unfortunately, their time together doesn't last long, as Kojiro gets busted by Koetsu's mother. Accompanying the woman back to town, the samurai takes a detour through a field. Suddenly, a member of the Yoshioka fiercely yells at them, causing only the woman to react. Seemingly locating the man they're looking for, the members try to determine if he's the real deal. With the only option being to test his strength, the leader of the group attempts to feel the stranger out. Getting lost in Kojiro's eyes, the older swordsman can't help but succumb to curiosity, drawing his blade for a duel. Receiving a faster answer than he was expecting, the former group leader learns just how powerful his opponent is. The other two have seen enough, trying to bring Kojiro back with them to their dojo. This doesn't pan out, as the deaf samurai would rather go his own way. Switching up their plan, the duo now wants revenge for their fallen comrade. Charging Kojiro from behind, the first man is effortlessly disemboweled. Turning to the final adversary, the swordsman is interrupted by a third party. Kojiro doesn't have a clue who this man is or what he's trying to convey, but his expression is frantic. Deciding against further violence, the fighter sheaths his weapon, surprising the desperate stranger. Before he knows it, Kojiro is brought to an unknown dojo, unsure of his new companion's objective. While the odd person next to him is busy running his mouth, the deaf samurai is more interested in his surroundings. Watching the students all around him, Kojiro recalls his homeland, thinking back to the training sessions by the sea. Exploring the unfamiliar area, the man is noticed by Ueda, who is under the impression that the old adversary has forgotten their fateful encounter. Suddenly, one of the members approaches Kojiro blade in hand. Running over to the wall, the deaf swordsman grabs a bokken for himself, ready for the sparring session. Striking the man on the shoulder, Kojiro causes the opponent to crumple onto the ground. Seeing more than enough proof that he's still capable, Ueda smiles, facing the old acquaintance for the first time in years. Going on to prostrate himself, the senior member is hopeful that the powerful fighter can help with their mission. Not understanding this gesture, Kojiro goes back to observing the various items of the dojo. For some reason, his companion has gotten exceptionally clingy recently, and the swordsman isn't a fan of being held down. Confusing him further, the stranger begins making odd motions with his hand. Annoyed with his behavior, Kojiro slaps it away, not realizing the weight of this action. Going on to find something of interest, the samurai examines the real blades they carry. Bringing one back to the man still bowing, it seems Kojiro is hoping for a duel. With a look of recognition on his face, the senior member realizes that the acquaintance does remember that night after all. Regrettably, the man still has things he needs to take care of, pushing the sword away in rejection. Disappointed, Kojiro is forced to accept the refusal. Strung along by his companion's whims, the deaf samurai is later treated to a feast. Unaware of the danger he's in, the man has no idea that Ueda's sense of honor has run out. Thankfully, this doesn't affect him in the slightest, as Kojiro casually heads back to the estate early the next morning. Running into a snowman made by Musashi, Kojiro is taken by the odd design. Using one of the arms as a makeshift blade, the noise gets Miyamoto's attention. Looking at the man across from him, Musashi feels like they may have met somewhere before. Unable to place the location, he watches as Kojiro's sword seemingly increases in presence. Bringing the stick down, the deaf samurai manages to partially cut the thick mound of snow. 
This surprises Musashi, but Kojiro isn't satisfied, knowing he can do better. Moving in various directions, the man gently follows the path of his blade, letting it guide him in his strokes. Trying another slash, Kojiro gets a little deeper, but still can't make it all the way through. Understanding the assignment, Miyamoto decides to try for himself. Solely using power, the swordsman doesn't get anywhere with his first attempt. As Musashi focuses inward, Kojiro takes the other stick for his own use. Continuing to follow his path, the deaf samurai sets an example, showing the other man how to loosen up. Releasing his tension, Miyamoto listens to his body's inner voice, watching his stick glide through the snow with little effort. Reflecting on his journey and the distractions therein, Musashi is brought back to reality when his stick is easily knocked away. Offering it back, Kojiro takes the opportunity to mess with the man a bit. Starting a play fight, the warriors dodge the blows being delivered. However, as their focus increases, the heavy presence returns to the makeshift weapons, projecting real damage with every successful move. Eventually, Kojiro gets especially excited, getting his actual sword ready to go. Waiting for Musashi to do the same, the deaf swordsman is met with the opposite signal. Having a calm mind state, Miyamoto has no desire to escalate things further. Willing to accept this, Kojiro puts his blade back in the sheath. Interrupting the match, the mother of the estate checks to make sure the two men are getting along. Breaking for dinner, the samurai properly introduce themselves to each other. Waking up the next morning for his duel, Musashi finds Kojiro in the backyard with his stick. Elegantly swinging, the deaf swordsman perfectly cuts the head of the snowman. Thrilled by the accomplishment, Miyamoto excitedly runs over. Happy to connect with a kindred spirit, Kojiro sends the man on his way. For the first time in a while, a friend was made without sacrifice. Going to his duel, Musashi leaves Kojiro behind to fulfill a year-long obligation. The two may have ended up seeing each other again, if it wasn't for the entirety of the Oshioka declaring war on Miyamoto. This outcome is unfortunate, as Kojiro has been asking about his friend's whereabouts ever since he left. Learning Tore Musashi's name, the deaf swordsman hopes for another meeting in the near future. A few days after news spreads of Miyamoto's battle, Koetsu receives a letter of invitation to recruit the samurai for official work. It seems rumors of their friendship had spread quickly, resulting in the older man getting messages on Musashi's behalf. Reading the letter for himself, Kojiro sees Miyamoto's name mixed in with the other characters. While it's not clear if he understands the contents, the feeling he gets from the document is one of melancholy. The chance meeting was just that, being a single moment in each of their paths. As the days carry on, a certain man from Kokura comes to Koetsu's estate, despite having his job request denied numerous times. Wanting a special sword of his sharpened by the retired master, the visitor is willing to do what it takes to fulfill the order. Thinking Koetsu is concerned that the blade's owner may be lacking, the retainer assures him that he has a talented samurai in mind to receive the weapon. Going by Ogawa, the visitor vouches for his ability, claiming him to be more skilled than various top instructors. Perfectly confident in the fighter's skill, the man even thinks that Ogawa could take on the fabled Musashi. Wondering where his companion disappeared to, the two older men hear a battle cry coming from outside, leaving to investigate the cause. Coming across the man in question, the retainer is shocked to find him knocked out. Wondering how this could have happened, he's even more surprised to discover that his opponent defeated him with a stick. Going back a few minutes earlier, Ogawa is found wandering around the outer portion of the estate. Noticing the sticks from Kojiro's time with Musashi, the man starts using one for a bit of training. Feeling someone's presence next to him, the swordsman turns to find Kojiro looking at him curiously. Striking the opponent with his blade, the deaf samurai's weapon comes across massive in size and weight. However, in reality, Kojiro's stick is the exact same as his adversary's. Being stabbed with a twig, Ogawa gets the full brunt of his opponent's weight, entirely focused into the tip. Asking for his name multiple times, the challenger finally realizes who he's dealing with. Hearing stories of Kojiro's talent, Ogawa is shocked that such an important encounter could happen with one so young. Stabbed again, the attack now feels like it's coming from an actual sword. Recoiling back, Ogawa becomes increasingly impressed with Kojiro's ability. Slashing upwards with a stick, the deaf swordsman delivers what appears to be a fatal blow. 
Once again, the strike ends up being surface level, but the opponent's perception continues to betray him. Thinking he could keep up, Ogawa figures he's being pushed back due to his lack of experience with the irregular weapon. Going with what he knows, the samurai draws his real blade, ready for round two. Properly introducing himself, Ogawa is glad that his personal path could eventually bring him to this moment. Waiting for Kojiro to bring his blade out, the challenger is surprised when he's again met with just a twig. Not budging on his decision, Ogawa prepares himself to cut his adversary down. Regaining cautiousness later that night, Ogawa is still mentally recovering from the strange duel. Losing the match, as well as his motivation, the samurai permanently gives up the sword. His retainer tries to encourage him to continue, but Ogawa feels that his lost love for the blade would make his path insincere. Wanting Kojiro to take his place as an instructor, the former swordsman is fully willing to support the new master from behind. The next day, the duo bows in respect to Kojiro, ready to head back home with the talented fighter. He receives an official document declaring his position, though most of it seems to confuse the man more than anything. Regardless, he's been in a similar situation before, and he knows when it's time to move on. Shaking hands before departure, Koetsu wishes Kojiro a safe trip. The mother is especially torn, sad to watch her rambunctious son leave the estate. Knowing this will be the last time they see each other, the two adults send the man off with a smile. Traveling across the sea, Kojiro finds himself at peace, sailing across familiar territory after all this time. Ogawa is concerned that bringing back a replacement instructor won't be well received, but hopes Kojiro's ability can help to justify the substitution. That said, the weight of the former teacher's decision finally hits him. Climbing the mass of the ship, he yells out his frustration with abandoning the sword. Following the man's example, Kojiro scales the tower himself, looking out towards its new destination. Living freely by the sword, Ogawa wonders just how far the samurai can go. Finally arriving in Kokura, the trio makes their way through the city. Wandering off, Kojiro leaves the other two behind, exploring the surroundings at his leisure. While he doesn't intend to cause any trouble, an interesting event takes place while crossing the bridge. Catching back up with Kojiro, the two men are dumbfounded at what they're seeing. Surrounded by cheering, the new instructor is somehow the center of attention. Shortly after, the entire city has gotten word of the man's amazing feats. Finding acceptance may be easier than Ogawa thinks, as Kojiro has effortlessly won everyone's admiration. Checking out the local shops, the deaf swordsman finds himself trying on some clothes. Tearing up at the sight of him, the woman in charge is reminded of her late husband. Remembering the girl from his village, Kojiro wipes away her tears, embracing the owner to calm her down. However, unlike his previous reluctance with romance, the man is now fully willing to go further. The following morning, the trio of men make their way to Kokura Castle, introducing Kojiro to the one in charge, known as Tadatoshi Hosokawa. While the leader isn't opposed to employing the samurai, it is questioned whether five instructors is too much given the current political landscape. Thinking of holding a contest, Tadatoshi wonders if Kojiro would be willing to fight for his new position. He has no issue with a duel, but his opponent is currently absent. Kaede, one of the other instructors, has a tendency of running late thanks to her escapades at the local bar. Luckily, her talent keeps her employed, and she arrives at the castle just in time for the match. Sizing the man up, Kaede isn't sure what to make of her adversary. 
Confusing her further, Kojiro discards his weapon and walks right up to her. Noticing an interesting piece of jewelry, the samurai's focus gets shifted elsewhere. Unfortunately for him, this action also exposes the woman's breasts, resulting in quick retaliation from the owner of the necklace. Witnessing the match, the Lord's Chief Fencing Instructor Ujie makes an appearance. The man's sinister nature seemingly betrays him, with Kojiro becoming aware of the strange aura. Getting some distance from the instructor, the swordsman is noticeably cautious. Coming across as an insult, Ogawa assures everyone that Kojiro will behave more acceptably in the future. Unfortunately, it'll take quite a bit of work to convince the group that the strange man belongs in their ranks. At the very least, Tadatoshi wants to see Kojiro's ability in some capacity before making a proper decision. Pitting him against Ujie, the new recruit gets another chance to prove himself. Regrettably, the results are the same, as Kojiro continues to hide himself from the one erupting with negative energy. Interrupting the festivities, an unknown party grabs the deaf samurai from behind. Going by Juzo Suga, another instructor is perfectly willing to take Ujie's place. Carrying himself with an air of superiority, his confidence is sorely misplaced. Shocking the collective audience, it seems that Kojiro has finally gotten serious. Coming in at just the right time, Tadatoshi's father Tadaoki likes what he sees. Requested by the older man to have a rematch, Kaede challenges Kojiro once again. Possibly sensing the woman's determination this time, the samurai snaps to attention. Initially getting pushed back, it doesn't take long for Kojiro to disarm his opponent. Thrilling Tadaoki with these results, the deaf swordsman has officially proven himself. However, the man is aware that Kojiro needs plenty of guidance to make him a worthy addition to the castle. Assigning Ogawa and Kaede as personal educators, Tadaoki is expecting great things in the near future. Learning of his vast amounts of popularity, the Lord plans to take advantage of this for political gain. That said, his son remains skeptical of the man his father is so enthusiastic about. Bringing in Kaede for her opinion on the previous match, she verifies Kojiro's ability without hesitation. With Tadaoke dead set on adding the samurai to their ranks, it's up to the instructors to make it happen. Enjoying what little freedom he has left, Kojiro was currently by himself near the coast. Practicing his swordsmanship on the beach, the man notices a group of kids hoping for a lesson. Coming full circle from his days with Jisai, Kojiro is now the master, though his students understandably have a hard time keeping up. Heading back inland, the samurai spots another woman he'd like to get close with. Unfortunately, the two instructors interrupt this meeting, bringing Kojiro back with them to begin his formal education. Starting with lessons in etiquette, Ogawa does his best to teach the clueless man. While he's doing what he can, Kojiro has no desire to learn, preferring to do his own thing. Failing in this endeavor, Ogawa tries helping the man improve his reading and writing capabilities. Growing bored with this, Kojiro continues to be rebellious. Leaving his mark on the wall, there's only one thing on the samurai's mind at this point. Tired of being cooped up, Kojiro is desperate to get out and see his friend again. Stuck in his responsibility to the castle, the deaf swordsman has no choice but to endure his position. As the days carry on, Tadaoki sends a few other men to observe the efficiency of the instructors. Kojiro is persistent in his ways, leading Ogawa to believe that getting on his level is a losing battle. Ignoring every instruction, the samurai only wants to listen to himself. He's a god when it comes to fighting, but not much else. Ogawa goes on to wonder if he's being denied by Kojiro because of their previous match. Regardless of the reason, the instructor has a duty to fulfill, and he plans to follow through. Sadly, nothing seems to do much good, with a formal dinner showing the lack of results. Watching his tiger steal other people's food, Tadaoki begins losing his patience. Throwing a bowl out of anger, the samurai deflects it easily with his chopsticks. While impressive in its own right, this only serves to make the Lord more furious, with Kojiro's behavior at the castle growing more problematic by the day. Adding another layer of uncertainty, this is where the series currently ends. Being one of the more interesting characters in the series, Kojiro carries himself far differently than anyone else. As someone who can't communicate normally, we only have the man's expressions and body language to go off of. 
While it would ordinarily be a difficult task to represent a character in this way, Inoue pulls this off beautifully, giving just enough visual information to make the story digestible. In some cases, certain panels say far more without any words. This imagery gives us a clear picture of Kojiro's overall demeanor, as well as his growth as a tiger. Keeping this in mind, there are actually some interesting parallels that can be drawn between Kojiro and actual tigers. I can't confirm whether or not Inoue took inspiration from the animals themselves, but you never know. To start off, tigers love to swim, usually for hours at a time. Possibly alluding to how each warrior carries himself, no two tigers have the same stripes. However, the most interesting fact by far is that tiger cubs are born blind. While it's not exactly the same, it's clear to see where the similarity lines up. Not only that, but the cubs can only follow the scent of their mother. This aspect connects elsewhere, so bookmark that for later. Apart from this animalistic side, Kojiro is also compared to something more fluid in nature. During Musashi's farming arc, the samurai mentions knowing a man who's like water. Carrying himself in this way, Kojiro has the freedom to approach life however he wants. That being said, he may be similar to water, but that also means he's susceptible to being shaped. This idea reflects the path of Kojiro's life. His initial terrain allowed for his flow to build momentum, and thanks to the external influence of Itosai, a raging river broke free. Leaving that environment for a new one, things got rockier, to the point of becoming a waterfall trying to survive. Completely at the mercy of the landscape, the water was forced to adapt, relentlessly carving a path through various obstacles. Finding terrain that leveled out, Kojiro had the opportunity to flow comfortably. Brought to Kokura, his momentum was halted, confined and left to stagnate in someone else's pond. Pushed by outside forces, Kojiro was transformed. However, his own flow was not only determined by his experiences, but also by his environment. Initially raised to be a house cat, in order to live a peaceful existence, free of risk, and in hopes of no disappointment or trouble, Kodra's life would take a drastically different turn, following the path a tiger walks. Gifted by the ocean, Kodra's purity during his childhood reflected the beautiful sea, which soon came to be his closest friend. With the very ocean in his eyes, Often stunning those who looked into them, Kodro naturally found in the swift and elegant movements of the sword his native language, and, in the years to come, his ambition. A couple of times did the sea attempt to take its son back, possibly warning Jisai of his future and inevitable departure. And yet, despite their tantrums, the waves always kept an eye on Kodro. In front of their shore, they spectated the boy learning about the dangers of the life he was choosing. That, if the sword indeed was a way to invigorate himself, it could also mean his demise. The fear of death was a sentiment Kodro hadn't developed when first approaching such a life, and it was probably his innocence to be at fault. The fact that being one with the sea constantly kept him immersed in its underwater silence leaving his mind without preoccupation. A first glimpse of the real world, of pain and hatred, and, unlike the safe heaven Jisai had created for him, was offered to Kajuro at various points, from finding Orin crying in a cave near the sea, to the kids from the village bullying him and his father, to Master Fudo, scarring him with terror and rage. For some time, Kodura's eyes showed fire whenever he would wield the sword. Looking at death curiously, he embraced those walking the same path, talking with them through the sword. It would only be in the mountains where Itosai was going to bring him that the fear of death, the feeling of mortality, and the subsequent respect for it would finally be acknowledged by Kodura. Alone, forsaken, exhausted from his long travels, cold and drenched by the rain, surrounded by the bloodthirst of a battlefield, 
and left to fight his way through those seeking revenge. It was in such conditions that Kodra was exposed to more of the real world and its mundanity. Unable to comprehend the situation, the man became the target of everyone's poverty, fear and desperation. It was here that he learned to respect death by fearing it. The ocean reclaimed its place in the eyes of the samurai. Away from the safety of his home, Kajura witnessed the dangers of the outside world for the very first time. Still, this didn't prevent him from finding yet another friend in the hell that was Sekigahara, a sea of corpses. Like a beast hiding in the mountains, Kajura fought his way through the claustrophobic trees and bushes to escape. Life after life, death after death. Finally reaching the top. Sadly, all he could find there was loneliness. As if being invincible under the sun was but mist. The mountains gave Kajura what he was missing. Shaping him into a samurai numb to the fear of death. While keeping that very fear ever present inside of him. This journey acted as a reminder of what the way of the sword carried, something he could never let go. That said, Kajura gave the mountains something in return, the smell and the sound of the ocean. Carrying them with him so far away from home, they became intertwined with his path. As he smiles, he truly becomes one with all, flowing infinite and free. Although he would maintain a level of purity, Kajuro also got a taste for blood, undeniably contributing to the spiral of death and killing. This was the only thing he had to stay away from to truly achieve perfection, but he's now been mired by his surroundings. Though the several tough situations he survived never fully impacted his playful and childish character, something with deeper meaning would affect him in Kyoto. More mature from his experience in the mountains, and reassured by his unparalleled level of skill, Kajuro meets Takezo once again, now under the name of Musashi. This positive encounter gives them both respite from the solitude of their respective journeys, Almost as if they know what the other has been through, Kajuro immediately perceives a connection with Musashi, as shown by him pinching the samurai's cheek, something he only ever used to do to people he bonded with. Like children, they embraced each other while playing with sticks, quickly becoming friends, and making memories that think back on fondly, anxious to meet again. Kajuro felt something in Kyoto when he almost drew his sword to challenge Musashi. It was as if they both felt the same thing, that neither would have been the winner. Possibly a hint at what they were missing. It wouldn't be Kyoto to provide them with an answer. Going their separate ways, this solution is left to be discovered in another place. Okura. Very successful with women, perhaps too successful, Kajura wouldn't have been seeking pleasure so often if he hadn't been under Itozai's influence. He was not lacking anything that physical pleasure could compensate for. Kajura simply went with the flow of life, always going along with its current. You might even say that life was going with Kajura's flow. An exchange of glances was all it took to make someone fall in love with him. A seemingly inconsequential duel with a stick eventually led him to a castle. Playing ball with another of his kind, the wind, quickly cast a spell on Kokura, turning it into his own town. Kajuro is like a spirit, desiring freedom as much as possible, for his own sake and to see his old friend again. Not much time is left until the final duel between him and Musashi at Funajima. Both of them, and especially Kojuro, 
are, in the current part of the story, steel, swords and beard that need proper sheaths. Okura will help them with just that, because a sharp sword that is always drawn turns everyone into an enemy. Until then, we continue to wait for the two rivals and friends to finally meet at Funajima. Out of all of Kojiro's influences, none is more encompassing than the sword itself. Immediately having an affinity for the blade, the weapon becomes an object of security. Not only that, but it's also what connects Kojiro to his surroundings. Learning the sword helped him gain his first friend as a child. Developing his skill allowed him to truly connect with his father over the years. Battling a real opponent gave him the opportunity to have deep conversations with others sharing the same love. Kojiro has no desire for fame or recognition. Rather, the man walks the path of the blade for his own satisfaction. Far ahead of his rival in this aspect, it ends up taking Musashi quite some time before he adapts a similar mindset. Going back to an earlier point, Jisai comments on how Kojiro treats the sword from his childhood as a parent of sorts. Most likely said as an offhanded remark, the older samurai has no idea how right he is. While the boy may be deaf, he still hears the exclusive flow inside of himself, guided by the blade. His limitation provides the purest path to the sword, listening to where it takes him and learning how to train his body along the way. During his battle against Sadakori on the summit, Kojiro is told that he's cherished by all swords, making his relationship with the blade even deeper. One example of this is when he had his sword stolen by Fudo. Having it used against him, his reaction can be interpreted in different ways. While it's easy enough to assume that his tears are because of fear, you could also say they're the result of having a family member turned against him. Similarly, the same happens with Sadakore. Having another sword stolen, Kojiro puts his life on the line to get it back. You could argue that he wants it back purely for survival, but given his ability, he could probably disarm someone easily enough. This blade was the one that kept Kojiro alive for the duration of the refugee hunt, and it's likely he wants to return the favor. In a different part of the story, Koetsu is sharpening Musashi's blade before his duel. Wanting to draw out the deepest color he can, this blue could be similar in nature to something else Kojiro is familiar with. Finding beauty in both of them, the cyclical appreciation for each could serve to deepen his bond further. That said, Koetsu mentions how truly dedicated samurai refuse additional colors, preferring to enhance their own as much as possible. Interestingly enough, during his fight with Itosai, Kojiro is said to be entirely clear. Embracing nothing else, the two pieces act as one. This may also be why the man is never deterred by the pain received from the sword. Being cut by Takuan, the boy cries, but quickly dries his tears. Having the blade taken away, the child waits for the chance to be reunited. Stabbed by Itosai, the samurai adapts to the injury. Somewhere inside of him, Kojiro must realize that without the sword, he has no way to interact with the outside world. Even if it is a dangerous weapon, the man learns to accept everything about it. Oddly enough, his demeanor gives him a notable edge when it comes to fighting. In an earlier part of the series, a certain technique is demonstrated, going by the way of without a blade. Harboring no malicious intent, the master easily disarms one opponent and effortlessly steals the weapon of the next. Rather than being absorbed in the self, his way was meant to release the ego. Kojiro follows this idea to some degree. While he does get a bit cocky early on, this self-importance gets curbed thanks to Itosai. More than anything, Kojiro wants to fight for the chance to communicate, as well as share his passion with other swordsmen. Itosai also notes how the deaf samurai never brings unnecessary emotion into battle. This lack of ill intent could be the reason a number of opponents get lost in the man's innocent gaze. Even against the hate-filled refugee hunters, Kojiro never attacks out of malice. While this applies to his general fighting, a far more obsessive habit pushes his behavior in the opposite direction. During his childhood, Kojiro follows the art of the blade purely for his own enjoyment. His duels with Tanki are energetic, but never too intense. 
It's when the boy faces off against Fudo that everything changes. The older man is the first person to ever present Kojiro with a challenge. Despite losing a hand, Fudo adapts to the situation and still manages to overwhelm the one with an advantage. This encounter permanently burns itself into Kojiro's mind, becoming the foundation for future development. A year after this battle, the young man uses the fight as a reference point. Not only that, but he now visualizes Fudo as a group of men, taking them on to improve his strength. This image training continues for years, with him gradually increasing the conditions of each match. By the time he's 17, Fudo has transformed into an army, relentlessly bearing down on the deaf samurai. The nightly sessions drill exceptional reflexes into Kojiro. However, it isn't long before another person takes Fudo's place. Kojiro may be able to take on endless numbers of his old adversary, but he has quite a bit of trouble dealing with Itosai. Their first fight ends up with the young man in a headlock, despite him having the initial strike. Going on to learn a number of harsh lessons from the senior disciple, Kojiro has it driven in that Itosai is a far more powerful opponent than Fudo. It takes a bit of time for us to see the young man's next projection, appearing to Gon as some fierce creature. Upon further inspection, a giant version of the samurai has taken Fudo's place, becoming Kojiro's next demon to defeat. Completely outclassing the previous fighter, a single iteration of Itosai is all it takes to keep the deaf swordsman in check. It may be questioned why Jisai never appeared in this way, to which I would offer three reasons. Firstly, the two men were constantly dueling, eliminating the need for visualization. Secondly, Kojiro doesn't view Jisai as someone he needs to conquer. This ties into the third point. Kojiro surpassed his master long before Itosai arrived. Although this image training is meant for improvement, it also acts as an outlet for emotion that's potentially built up. Taking his fury out on imaginary opponents, Kojiro prevents himself from releasing this energy constantly. This ties into another interesting aspect of the man's demeanor. Kojiro almost never draws his sword until he's invited to. The first time this happens is during the intense battle on the coast, being looked at intently by a man desperate to cut down his peers. The next instance takes place just after leaving his village, becoming interested in a fight after bandits make their intentions known. Being presented with weapons and encouraged to use one, Kojiro takes Gon up on his offer. Ignoring a request to draw his blade, the deaf samurai waits for the challenger at the restaurant to kick things off. When the man is faced with Ogawa's sword, he strikes back with his weapon of choice. In Kokura, the swordsman parries multiple attacks that come his way. While the beach fight was more a result of Kojiro's curiosity, it's very possible that being stabbed by Itosai gave him a reference point for his actions. Understanding the pain he'll be inflicting, the man feels fear, and may even comprehend the fragile weight of his life. Holding that experience close, he makes absolutely sure that any new opponents are prepared for what comes next. His time on the battlefield is pretty self-explanatory, as it's the time spent fighting the refugee hunters and his duel against a group of soldiers. These fights were forced, putting Kojiro in a position of self-defense for his survival. Those instances aside, there are only two times in the entire series where Kojiro willingly draws his blade first. Reuniting with Itosai, the young man fully recognizes his condescending attitude. Ready to give him what he wants, Kojiro shows just how serious he is. On the other hand, the samurai's excitement makes him draw his sword again after meeting Musashi. However, with his opponent being the opposite of Itosai, Kojiro seems to realize that further violence isn't necessary here. All of these interactions provide a lot of insight on Kojiro's mindset, but there's another contributing factor to consider in relation to this. The deaf swordsman certainly has his own connection to the blade, but he also took bits and pieces of himself from others he came into contact with. Having a link to the sword in some way or another, these individuals teach Kojiro various lessons through their interactions. Right from the beginning, Jisai is nothing but negative when it comes to the way of the sword. Broken and defeated, his path only led him to ruin. This is interesting given that Jisai is essentially who Musashi could have been. With only a select few rising to the top, the older samurai embodies the collective failure of the warriors who stayed alive but weren't able to realize their dream. Given a second chance with Kojiro, the man is determined to keep his son away from the blade at all costs. 
Unfortunately, the fierce opposition only serves to bring the boy closer to it. Saving his son from Fudo, Jisai unintentionally fuels the fire even more. Trying a different approach, the old master actively duels Kojiro for years, continuously beating him to snuff out the passion he holds onto. This only serves to prepare the son for a variety of situations, though with him already being stronger than Jisai, these matches serve as supplementary training. Having another purpose, they give the two family members the opportunity to truly connect. Being the first person Kojiro officially talked to, Jisai gets the credit for showing his son a special way to communicate. Both sharing a love of the sword, a special bond was formed that the deaf swordsman will always carry with him. Fudo's relationship with the blade is a little more extreme. Displaying a body that's completely covered in scars, the man has been quite intimate with his sword. Having a mindset similar to Itosai, the samurai most likely also has a past in the same vein as Musashi. That said, Jisai questions what kind of position the opponent may have held somewhere else. It's entirely possible that with his skill, Fudo was employed by someone reputable. However, given his infatuation with the warrior's path, there's a chance he was fired from said occupation for causing trouble. Randomly wandering to Kojiro's village, the man was in the right place at the right time to earn himself a new position. Facing off against the deaf swordsman, more of Fudo's eccentricities come to the surface. Taking care of his severed hand, the fighter is surprisingly easygoing about the loss, even claiming it to be beneficial. Having fun as the underdog, Fudo seems to prefer a challenge rather than an easy win. Although Kojiro can't hear any of his dialogue, he still takes notice of how the adversary carries himself. Thanks to this encounter, the boy acquired a high bar of skill to shoot for. Being his introduction to the violent world outside of the village, Fudo made Kojiro want to train harder than ever. If it weren't for the scarred samurai, the young swordsman may not have been nearly as formidable in the future. The nameless samurai on the beach, also known as Denshichiro, ends up having an interesting effect on Kojiro during their fight. After the deaf swordsman has his leg stabbed by Itosai, he gets a taste of fear while facing off against this new opponent. Unexpectedly, the large man inflicts the same injury onto himself. Watching Denshichiro grimace in pain, Kojiro makes a similar expression, empathizing with his suffering. Pointing to his leg, the adversary then motions to Kojiro's leg, showing him that they're even now. Determinedly smiling at the deaf warrior, Denshichiro invites his opponent. Matching the man's energy, Kojiro goes back to smiling, ready to continue the duel. Having a lengthy conversation with the Blade, the Yoshioka member had nothing but good things to say about the young man afterwards. This battle helped expand Kojiro's horizons in an unexpected way. Being a more compassionate fighter, Denshichiro made it clear to him that not all warriors are simply out for blood. Through their interaction, Kojiro was introduced to honor and became more aware of his own humanity. Itosai easily has the greatest effect on Kojiro's development as a whole. He has an exceptionally focused view of the sword, going far beyond self-improvement. Craving battles with strong opponents, the man considers the life and death struggle to be an intriguing game. Leaving his old master, Itosai traveled on his own for years, making a name for himself as a byproduct of his own self-satisfaction. Regrettably, the samurai eventually hits a wall, running out of playmates that can keep up with him. Having his interest peaked watching Kojiro, Itosai does everything he can to raise the boy to a proper rival. Aggressively pushing him into a duel against dangerous adversaries, the older samurai initiates a trial by fire. Seeing the boy numb to the violence, Itosai quickly fixes this, not wanting his toy to die a hasty death. Making it through the night, Kojiro gets a taste for blood, so Itosai brings him to a more intense battlefield. Clearing these parameters, the senior disciple begins the ultimate test. Taking a gamble, Itosai essentially leaves his companion to die. That said, he knows that this experience will truly make Kojiro a monster if he survives. If he doesn't, then it only serves to prove that the young man will never end up being a match for him. For Itosai, this is a win-lose scenario. After all, the older swordsman isn't doing this for Kojiro's sake, he's doing it for his. Seeing the deaf man return, Itosai gets excited, watching his hard work bear fruit. Grateful that Kojiro made it, the senior disciple plans to thank him with a high-level duel. Considering the opponent to be greater than him, Itosai finally gets his rival. Being full to the brim with ego, Kojiro is the perfect match, not having a drop of self-importance. Unfortunately, Itosai pays the price for holding back, not wanting to end the fun with a single strike. 
Following his duel with Musashi, the older man recalls the satisfaction he felt from both of his opponents. Wondering what his next destination should be, he looks to the horizon for an answer. For everything he was able to teach Kojiro, Ito Sai was left with almost nothing in return. Of all the things he could have learned, it may have been to his benefit to take in the deaf samurai sense of flow. After all, there's far more to life than a single leaf. When it comes to the group of soldiers on the mountain, you could argue that each of them provides an important lesson to Kojiro. Sadakori stealing his blade made him think critically about his situation. Faced with no other choice but fighting back, Kojiro utilized his surroundings effectively, employing a hidden trick similar to the ones Jisai used. With survival being key, nothing was off the table. Moving on to Ichizo, the lesson reinforced here was basic, but essential. Don't let your mind wander. The second you lose your focus, you're dead. Fighting with Kone, Kojiro made a number of discoveries in relation to his technique. Not only that, but this was the first time the man had ever faced off against someone so passionate. The world is a big place, and Kojiro saw that no matter where you went, he would always have the opportunity to make a connection. There are also a few other individuals that have some interesting takes on the way of the sword in general. Take Matahachi, for example. After watching Kojiro effortlessly cut down two members of the Oshioka, the man makes a brave attempt to save the third. Matahachi makes the point that even if someone loses a duel, they should still be allowed to live. This is questionable in a lot of ways. He's certainly not wrong in saying this, but the path of the sword isn't nearly that forgiving. During his duel at the restaurant, Kojiro gives the challenger the match he wants. Despite his loss, the warrior was satisfied with the outcome, glad he could face such a strong opponent. Likewise, Musashi has similar encounters, pursued by men willing to die honorably. Denshichiro nearly died while fighting Kojiro, but he still considered the experience entirely worthwhile. This is what Matahachi fails to realize. Exceptions aside, those who follow the sword are involved by choice. Everyone's life is on the line, but that's the price to pay for chasing a heat haze. In a similar vein, Koetsu talks about his own viewpoints of the blade on a few occasions. In general, while the sword was made for the purpose of killing, the master still feels that within that, there's beauty worth appreciating. The weapon is beautiful because it kills, with no beauty derived from a katana denied its purpose. Held by individuals that serve to utilize the sword's potential, an artful duo is formed. Viewed as the height of beauty, Koetsu doesn't consider it evil to cut someone down for the sake of the path. That said, he also states that the blade isn't important enough for killing to be necessary, saying how strength and beauty are the same thing. Takawan mentions in an earlier chapter that true power stems from being kind. While there's beauty in someone who dedicates themselves fully to the sword, is that enough, even if they don't kill? Alternatively, should recognizing the sanctity of life take precedence instead? After all, Takawan said something similar to Musashi back in his original village. Everyone who gets killed has something they care about stolen away. From his perspective, the soul is most important, with all of humanity deserving a fair chance at existence. The world is no doubt full of subjective views on this topic. At the end of the day, any number of things can be considered beautiful. The sword is no different in this context. However, in its purest form, a blade is meant to pass on death, and those attracted to it will use it as such. There's one final segment I'd like to discuss, in relation to the battle between Musashi and Kojiro. While the manga hasn't gotten to this point, it's already known from other sources that Musashi is the one that comes out on top. Thinking about the overall journeys of both men, I'd like to present some reasoning as to why this outcome makes sense. While Koetsu sharpens a blade for Kojiro, Takawan comments on how the swordsmen are two halves of a pair. If each of them is a sword, then the other acts as their sheath. Although they both appreciate the blade, they have different approaches to their own respective path. Kojiro brings out Musashi's creativity and freedom, while Musashi keeps Kojiro more grounded. As the two exist as pariahs, they share a certain level of kinship. However, as Ogawa's retainer states, being the best means getting rid of all competition. Eventually, they'll have to fight, with each man fully aware of this inevitability. That said, this wouldn't be done out of a desire for rank or personal gain, but out of pure enthusiasm to challenge each other. With blades being how they communicate, it would probably be the deepest conversation either one has ever had. Regrettably, it's in this that Kojiro becomes stifled while employed. 
No one really understands him. He's unable to convey himself properly, and he can't fight the way he wants to. Having his freedom claimed by someone who wants full control, Kojiro finds himself unable to grow. Of course, even when he's given the opportunity to learn new things, the man has no interest whatsoever. On the other side of things, Musashi has the privilege of being able to talk and state how he's feeling, but there's another major advantage he has, his development. From the start, Miyamoto is wild when it comes to fighting, having a one-track mind that pushes himself to improve. More than anything, making a name for himself as his driving force. Learning that invincibility isn't all that important, the Agu Master sets Musashi on a path of rethinking everything. This is taken further when his match against Shishido Baiken makes him question the weight of his pride. The battles that follow impart a sense of humility to Musashi, helping him understand the weight of a life. After his battle against the entirety of the Oshioka, the samurai is imprisoned for a brief period. During this time, a man interested in enlisting Musashi comes to visit. Talking about his own past with the sword, the visitor redefines the definition of strength. If this power is purely meant for killing, then nothing can truly be attained. However, mentioning the option of a middle path, another solution can be found. For him, strength means being able to fight, but using it to move towards peace instead. Continuing on his journey, Musashi makes an attempt to stifle his ego, but Itosai reminds him that he still has an obligation to remain on the sword's path. Taking this in stride, Miyamoto starts to listen more closely to his inner voice, attempting to eliminate outside elements. Thanks to this, the samurai dives deeper into the flow he's had locked away. That said, he's still not completely satisfied, wanting a proper resolution for his journey. Desiring a match with one more strong opponent, Musashi hopes to avoid the mistakes of those that clung to the blade for the wrong reasons. Falling back to the earth, he remembers the start of his original expedition, pushing his ego back even further. Up to this point, Musashi has gone through a tremendous amount of growth. That said, the most important lessons come from a very unexpected location. The farming arc tends to be met with criticism for having a remarkably slow pace. Compared to the other parts, it isn't particularly action-packed, causing some readers to completely disregard it. Honestly, that's a real shame, because this section is where Musashi finally comes to understand his path. Starting from that moment on the ground, the man has already begun his training. Regardless of how he struggles, the sword hasn't brought him any closer to heaven than it did during his early days. While Musashi allows the sword to guide him, he knows that he needs to rein it back in to some degree. Rather than indulging himself in fighting for the sake of power and fame, Musashi wants to go back to when learning the blade was about self-satisfaction. Making his way to a small village nearby, the samurai ends up staying with the young boy. Helping him cultivate a field, Musashi hopes to leave the child with a means of providing for himself. Unfortunately, this marks the start of a match with heaven itself, battling the elements to develop the land. Along the way, Miyamoto comes across some additional enlightenment. As water becomes his enemy both figuratively and literally, Musashi's work has purpose in that a solution for one can apply to the other. Failing in his attempts to tame his field, a more experienced farmer invites Miyamoto to compare his earth to the seemingly useless soil. Told that nothing can be heard from his earth, you could also use this as a parallel to Musashi's foundation. With a mindset that's still too basic, he isn't able to properly accommodate the water he plans to overcome. Eventually, men from Kokura want to offer Miyamoto a job, but the samurai turns them down. Giving them a reason for this, Musashi states that he wants to discover a different kind of strength. Putting a hold on the spiral of death and killing, he isn't looking to become strong in this way. His idea of being strong lies within his own mentality. For Miyamoto, self-reflection and introspection are key here. Not considering himself ready to move on from this, the man remains in the village. Musashi goes on to contemplate the meaning of strength, saying it's the embodiment of taking developments in while maintaining your original state of mind. Approaching the sword from this new angle, the man plans to incorporate this sense of equanimity into his life. Continuing to let go of his ego, Musashi wants power that isn't directly linked to the blade. The samurai knows it's more beneficial to expand the limits of his mind and body, rather than solely focusing on the katana. As the village starts running out of food, Musashi has a moment where he collapses from exhaustion. While in this condition, he visualizes the slain members of the Yoshioka. Waking back up, he then goes on to see Shishido Baiken, as well as the young girl that lived with him. On the cusp of starvation, Miyamoto also sees the younger form of Baiken from the start of his journey. 
Taking his old opponents into account, the samurai reflects on his actions and reasoning, forced to carry those memories. While it's a burden, those experiences keep him grounded. Begging for help, Musashi finally eliminates his lingering ego. At peace with himself, strength bends to kindness. Asked what the purpose is in dueling someone he has no animosity towards, Miyamoto knows how crazy it sounds. Far beyond killing for the sake of killing, the samurai simply wants to share his passion for the sword with an opponent who understands. Questioned what kind of journey he's had until now, Musashi compares himself to a horse carrying an immense load. Looking up now, the swordsman sees nothing, free to move as he pleases. Dropping to the ground, it seems that Musashi has been released of that heavy weight. Surprised by a remark from one of the villagers, the samurai's smile gives him away. Miyamoto planted the seeds for change upon his arrival, and after a lot of personal growth, the results are in full bloom. This is why I believe Kojiro loses the upcoming duel. Both men fought countless opponents on their way to the top, but only one truly questioned himself in doing this. Kojiro improved in regards to his technique, but Musashi changed a number of things that eventually helped him strike a balance in his life. If we look at the deaf samurai through the lens of the farming arc, certain differences are noticeable. Kojiro's foundation is flourishing, but having too much water, the ground gets lost underneath. He certainly has a mind that doesn't sway, but it's debatable if he's gone through significant changes that aren't related to the sword. Kojiro does reflect on past adversaries, but only when it's for the sole purpose of making him stronger. In short, everything in his life is for the sword, meaning there's no room for change. From the start, Kojiro has been led down an inescapable path by the blade. His existence embraces the sword, wherever the flow takes him. The water itself doesn't choose, it simply obeys. In light of this, Kojiro will eventually learn a painful lesson. With the ebb of his life taking place, the samurai may start finding himself lacking in many crucial areas. Refusing an excess of color is one thing, but avoiding it altogether is another. Regardless, we know the outcome. A tiger will fight a dragon, and it's going to be a hell of a sight. Special thanks to my awesome literary club members, Elder Flow, Ready!